Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brusso. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a show about weirdos, doggone it. My name is John Boy. It is John Boy time. I am the COVID kid. I am COVID barely 18. My name is John Fahey, your host, joining me as ever. Doctors hate this geyser. It's Aaron Joseph Peter. Doctors hate this goozer. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one simple trick. <laughs> got one to simple. logging in. One simple thing. It's a banned African ritual. It's a swamp thing. Oh, God. I get it. It's a swamp. It's a, yeah, it's a swamp right. It's a swamp thing. It's a salt life. <laughs> uh, I'm the daddy of the Mac daddy. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's up, Matt? Hi. To your right, my left, handsome Matt Brousseau. Oh, hi there. How are you? I feel like a goddamn goof. Yeah? It's fantastic. <laughs> you look crazy, too. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty really like... like wild, man. Yeah. yeah. You look... You look really nuts, man. Yeah, yeah. The good good nuts, facial hair. Oh, you bad, look... bad facial hair goes <laughs> a long way. Yeah, we watched the opening of this Nurse Ratchet thing, and the, the head... There's a guy that kills, like, a bunch of priests in the beginning. Very beginning. Oh, Batman. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then it goes, uh... The headline the headline for the paper goes question mark after this. Priest killer nutso? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Jacko Wacko? How about this? On Pri- his back? <laughs> yeah. Priest killer perfectly sane. <laughs> what uh, yeah, of course he's nutso. Lone gunman. <laughs> Have friends? <laughs> Aaron. Hey. Um, I was going to do our, uh, a little tasty piece for our friend Kim Frazier, but I'm, you got a long one, so I'm going to postpone that. Thank you, Kim. Is uh, it thick, though? It's, 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 yeah. it's a thicky. It, it's and it's, and it's, it's a sicky. And it's a sicky. <laughs> it's, it's, it's but a, Kim, it's Kim, a uh, Kim we, will, we will get to it. We will. We it's do a, love you. It's a little treat. And um, just to, you know, I'll just stay on that hook a little longer, partner. <laughs> we're coming <laughs> to take oh, Harry. Oh, oh, God. The worm's about to slip. Now, would you mind doing me a favor and giving just maybe the briefest uh, little recap on where we left off? Right. That's exactly what I'm going to do, John. Um, mm. So when we last uh, were with... Because uh, I told you to. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 you're already cutting him off. I know. I'm sorry. I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> Will you shut up, man? <laughs> I'm talking. I'm talking. Uh, so when we were last with Slim, uh, he had burned his bottom woman, uh, and uh, he heard the feds were on to him from his good uh, mentor, Baby Bell. Um, he went into hiding uh, in his in his little his little room, and then. Um, he went out to go score some heroin, mm-hmm. and he got caught. He got picked up. Yeah, happens to the best of us. Should have stayed in the room, right? Now, where's party time? <laughs> oh, party time, I think, died. Really? Yeah, I think, well, well he's dead now. Party's over. Um, he didn't open up a party city or... No, or Halloween town <laughs> yeah. or nothing like that. <laughs> uh, he got caught, and he got arrested, and he went to... Um, he went to Cook County Jail, and he was arrested for violating the Mann Act. And the Mann Act is also known as the White Slavery Act, and it's basically transporting uh, people across state lines for... Uh, purposes. Yeah, pros- n- n- nefarious purposes of prostitution and sexual impropriety. Sure, sure. So he sent to Cook County Jail, and it's basically... A, it's an overcrowded lockup of drug addicts and pickpockets and homeless men serving short sentences. And... Um, this is a, a real shithole as he's, he's basically, he's waiting for like arraignment and, and eventually trial at this Cook County lockup six by 10 foot cells. Um, and he says that the, the tiny cell was too small for two men and there were eight of us in it. Jesus Christ. I was lying on the concrete floor. My cellmates were bums and junkies. Two of them were getting sick and puking all over. <laughs> the bums were stinking almost as bad as the junkies. Mm. A drunk lying beside me dug his fingernails into his scalp and crotch over and over again. Oh, oh. Christ almighty. So he's in, he's, he's in this lockup for the violating the manic, right? <clears throat> he's also wanted by the U.S. Marshals for failure to update his address of record for the draft. Whoa. Because this is, you know, this is the uh, the 40s. This is the 40s now. Uh, World War II is going on. So he makes a deal with the Attorney General of Wisconsin uh, that would uh, allow the draft evasion charges would be dropped um, if he pleads guilty 
to the Man Act violation, and they would pursue a light sentence for him if he if he pleads guilty to that. Because he he otherwise would for just the Man Act violation be up for five to ten years. Um, so he borrows some money from his mother's new husband, Ural Beck, uh, and he posts bail. And he so he posts bail because now he finds some time until his his trial. He goes straight back to the streets to try and muster up some cash um, to like, pay get, for a lawyer. Get to work. And uh, but <clears throat> I think if I think in four months he maybe like turned three tricks or something like that. Didn't he's like mm-hmm. I think people just didn't want to work for a pimp where they knew the money was gonna go just to like paying off his his bail and no, it's mm-hmm. gonna go to grocery. And they just knew he was burned. Yeah, you know he just they're watching. Like you're not gonna work for him. Mm. So. Um, he has his, his trial, and he's sentenced to 18 months at Leavenworth. Yikes. Federal Penitentiary in Kansas, and this is also known as the Hot House. It's and this is like yeah. Carl Penn's room. Yeah, Leavenworth is heavy-duty federal... Federal federal prison, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the walls go 20 feet up and 40 feet down under the ground. Yeah. Solid concrete, so you can't even, like, can't even dig your way out. Yeah. You gotta go all the way to China. <laughs> China. China. Um, there is uh, you. There are there are no exits. Like you can't see any exits from from the from the prisoners area. Um, all you can see looking up is endless Kansas sky. It's kind of madness inducing. Hmm. Um, and they have these like cathedral windows that the sun beams in, and that's why they call it the hot house because it just says there's no ventilation in the in the like in all the cell blocks hmm. so the air just stagnates and that's why it's called the hot house because it gets this greenhouse effect there yeah i'm sure it has no negative mental effects none at all yeah. whatsoever none um so then he's got like you know they put you in quarantine first and then they do like the you know your medical exams and then your psychological eval he gets a contrary to what he says in pimp where he says he has 175 iq he gets 105 on the on his on his IQ test, which is uh-huh. you know slightly above average. Um, <clears throat> he lies to he lies about a bunch of shit on all of his like official um, admission records and stuff like that. He lies to his shrink during his entrance again exam. He says he graduated high school hmm. and he studied agriculture at Tuskegee Institute. And it said after he graduated from there, he worked as a salesman of fine women's hosiery, mm. a, a hotel clerk, a singer, a nightclub dancer, and magician. Wow. Well, you know, unofficially, you know, amateur. Yeah, I mean, I'm an amateur yeah. prestidigitation enthusiast. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, and uh, he said that, like, the, this prison was full of just, like, all sorts of dangerous motherfuckers. Uh, and they all, like... Is is also during the time of segregation, so they're not only segregated by race, but they also segregate into like different cliques. Like yeah, the fucking one hundred five IQs. <laughs> yeah, but you mean like you mean like uh, gangs? Yeah, or, gangs. yeah. Um, mostly, so he segregated in the D block where the other black men are. He says mostly pimps, drug dealers, and stick up men, and um, he said that. Uh, you know, because then you have like yard time after after you're in your cell block. You know, with your I love yard time. <laughs> <laughs> yard time. <laughs> you don't get enough of it. Um, no. He said that during you know once when in all the integrated time, uh, he said the most dangerous groups were the su- the Southern cons, and they hated Negroes. He says. Wait, wait. Are, are Southern whites, Southern blacks, Southern whites. Okay. Yeah, I. During this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And he said that it's just like a lot of in, like just it was just really fucked up. <laughs> and he's in his twenties now. Um, the rivalries are sometimes over sexual partners. Mm. Uh, he, he, fellas, the, fellas, he's ready. <laughs> I don't want to see two shivs in his. <laughs> um, one you of his can't friends have him. I want him. He's mine. One of his friends. I'm dangerous. <laughs> one of his friends in the in the joint named Doll Baby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you can't fuck doll baby. You can't call it. <laughs> you don't like doll baby? I like it a lot. Yeah, that's the problem. Stole a quote lanky white boy with watery blue eyes and bleached corn silk hair from a jealous white con from Mississippi. <laughs> uh oh. 
Oh, he was nearly trouble. stabbed to death. <laughs> <laughs> he was stabbed to death? Nearly. He watched, like, this was in the hundreds of, of men packed around, like, the action, just kind of, like, crowding everybody out and keeping, like, the guards the away. The COs. Said, yeah. And uh, all he saw was Dahl throw up his hands and screamed. And he, the guy, you know, shivved him, uh, like, fucking 15 times. And he said blood was gushing from his mouth and out of the holes in his prison uniform. Oh, God. And he, see, he said he barely, he barely survived. Wow. Um, and what happened to the to corn-fed... Uh... Oh, I think he was just fucking getting reamed. Um, <laughs> prison inside the prison. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think everybody probably wanted to fuck him after that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I and mean, he like no. killed the guy because no, of this sweet doll sweet. baby almost died to fuck you. Finally know his worth. Yeah, he's probably trading at like several cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. That's, the stock that's funny. Crazy. You should mention that. <laughs> funny. <laughs> uh, so he tries to keep his head down um, because of this, and, and and you know he would get really lonely too you know and he um he would consider you know maybe, think about it yeah because i sucked a fucking you thing know, there there were uh, <laughs> according to his his account uh, there were half a dozen cells or two packs of butts cigarette could summon a pink puckered anus to press eagerly against the bars for a guy's blood swollen organ to get rip out off. two uh, two packs two packs of cigs for a now pack. that's i mean a couple of cheeks. yeah a couple puckered cheeks Ugh. For your and, blood swollen and this thing's organ? pink. That's right. You promise? Yep. I mean, that's cheap. Uh, I mean, we're yeah. talking about bussy here. The Scott's on <laughs> and it. And next week, we got the bussy boss on the show, Ooh. Joe K. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, I understand you're the bussy boss. Now, Is that right? he's got a wet ass pussy. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. Um, instead of, uh, according to his account, instead of the pink puckered anus, he would close my eyes and flog my monster. Hmm. He never yeah. went for it. No, that's what he says. He never went for it. Um, but he channeled he channeled this energy into into reading and studying. And you know, in his previous prison bits, he would he, he read a lot of fiction. I told you about he read um, Picture Dorian Gray and stuff yeah. like that. Um, he uh, he took a class. He took some inter- independent uh, courses from his cell and and, and an in person class on uh, called Human Problems. He had weekly therapy sessions with his shrink, Doctor Crumb Beagle. Crumb Beagle. Crumb Beagle. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Dr. Crumb Beagle was... Um, mm. Taken seriously by everyone. That's yeah, right. Of course. Ah, yes, he's Crumb Beagle. He, uh, he was, a, he was a, of the Freudian discipline, mm. and, um, <laughs> and he, be- he, he believed that pimps, especially black pimps, had unresolved issues with their mothers. Which I asked you about in the first episode. That's right. Yes. And so, it, I mean, but Slim did make some breakthroughs with him on this. Really? Yeah. Um, he was initially skeptical... About um, all the unconscious drives and you know the, these these motivators that that you read about in in Freud, um, but the doctor gave him a copy of *The Human Mind* by Carl Menninger, and that came out just a few years prior to this. Mm. Uh, and, it, and that convinced him. Yeah, it, because in it he said um, criminals are only slightly different than normal people due to traumatic experiences in their past. Yes, and this really resonated with him, and so he kind of he got really into. Psychi- psychiatry, psychology, mm. psych- psychoneurosis, and, and studying yeah. this. Well, in, in in its own way too, the the uh, skepticism of it is is so understandable because it's a narrative. Mm-hmm. And the pimps always make a narrative. Yeah, I know you're, that, trying, you're trying to pimp me with something. Yeah, you're trying to tell right. me you're, you're trying to get pimped, and you're saying like, oh, it's it's all because of my mom, and you're showing me, and blah blah blah. So. Yeah, uh, I would have I would have a, a healthy skepticism mm-hmm. of that too. And, so, and you're in prison, and it's a white guy, and like, yeah. you're just, it's all bullshit, you know. Yeah, you've yeah. always been told that you're this, knowing that you're not that. Um, but also at the same time, I'm sure he recognized similar patterns between. Uh, it all started to click for him. Yeah, and he's, I mean, between he really he used was do. a voracious reader um, at this time, and he uh, it helped him get through this time in prison. Yeah. Uh, and it transformed his concept of pimping entirely. Hmm. So, I mean, he wasn't, I mean, he, he knew he was going to get out of it. He's a learned pimp. Yeah. Right. Um, he would do this, he would, um, <laughs> he would learn what he used or he would use what he learned, uh, later once he got out, he would use something called the mama rundown. And this uh, is a Crumberger. Crumb Beagle special? <laughs> yeah. It, iceberg, Crumb Beagle. <laughs> <laughs> Crumb Theory <Burger>. of pimping. <laughs> um, this is a Crumb so Bird collab. You know, it would help him get... He pitched Watch this story. <laughs> he pinched this story and he had simpy, right? So he would say... to uh, He would say... Uh, <laughs> you know, the effect was to... 
show the roots of his own pain to a prospective prostitute. Um, Respect. And uh, so he would say, you know, <laughs> my dad and mama fought like pit bulldogs. One early bright. He pranced home stone broke with his fly fouled with cum. His mustache <laughs> starched with cunt juice. Oh. He beat the puking living crap out of mama. He bounced me off a tenement wall to close his act. He split with a cardboard suitcase and his pearl gray splats fashioned into zero win. And so he would talk about his mother keeping him alive, mm. um, you know, by going door to door, doing hairstyle jobs and stuff like yeah. that. And then... Um, then yeah, I, I like that you lean a little towards doing the impression of the way he actually sounds. <laughs> it's like... Well, I'm doing, my the, mom, I'm doing my, the audio book. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of doing what the guy in the my audio book. My mama had like. me like Chris Christie with COVID, <laughs> hooked up to a vending machine. <laughs> Dr. Pepper was making his rounds. <laughs> Everybody was on the game. Um, his audio shit is like, mm. it's like deliberate punctuation of yeah. certain things. Like yeah. He's got, he does like a, have a very smooth, it's very jazz. I yeah. would say. Oh, of course. I imagine he's when he's, voice. he's reading some of the quotes, too, it's probably... So, you know, he would tell this story to... to he would use the mom to run down and then in talking about his trip to Rockford and when she met, St uh, you know, um, Henry and how, how he loved Henry and how Steve came and ruined it all. Steve! And all. Steve! <laughs> and, um, and that is also how he starts the book. With that? He starts the book... He starts with Mama. Well, he starts with... I, I was forced to eat pussy at three years old. Yeah. And then the, yeah, my dad threw me against the wall and right. then, you know, she found another guy and he, I mean, so he's pimping the reader in the beginning of his own book with yeah. things that he learned in prison that yeah. he used on prostitutes later to elicit sympathy. Um, and then, you know, you find out that through records from Leavenworth, you find out that he might have, might have lied about his non-existent relationship with his father after this because prison records show that he had actually reached out to prison officials when he was up for parole and, um, or they reached out to him and he responded back via correspondence, um, because he had offered up his place, um, to stay while he was out on parole. Really? Yeah. And there were records, you know, like letters between like the warden and the psychiatrist about like, you know, this may be a good thing for him to be with a, you know, strong figure, all that stuff to make his transition into the real world. No better. shit. So it seems like his dad later on in life was not totally absent because he's totally after the beginning, he's pretty much left out of the book until, until the very end where there's like one last scene. Right. Uh, with him, which may have never even happened. Where they're right? playing catch in a cornfield. Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah, we yeah. just talked about this the other night. Yeah, <laughs> field, field of Dreams. Yeah, yeah. We, were. yeah we were. We went <laughs> off on Field of Dreams the other night. That's so weird that yeah. you brought that up because yeah. I'm about to make that joke. <laughs> I'm like, was it Ray Liotta and he yeah. wanted to catch? Hey, Dad, <laughs> want to have a snatch? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Aaron. What? Well, he's a pimp. People will come, Sean. People will come. Yeah. Well, certainly. In August, hey, is that a pink anus on there? <laughs> I'm going to stuff the fucking a thing. A couple of butts with some butts. <laughs> Shove them against the bars. Um, in August 1946, he's released with $18.66 to his name. Nice. And the clothes on his back. So he's, bit, he's completely starting over. Um, now he's 28. And prison time and the stress of pimp life and drugs have aged him sure he says i was 28 but i looked 40 like mm -hmm. i just was run down my hair was thinning and all. i just wasn't the pretty thin wasted iceberg that i was you know in my late teens and early 20s yeah um but he was armed with this new knowledge knowledge he, yeah so he had perspective that he had perspective so he had the pimp book and then he had actual books right Ah, uh -huh, that's the trick. And so <laughs> he um, he heads to Chicago after he, after he visits his mother for a week. He visits his mom, and then and then he heads to Chicago. And what he says about starting over is, uh, I just I, I have to read from from the book every time because just the way it's written is just it's part of his appeal. Uh, I was turning twenty eight, but I looked forty. For seven years, I had devoted myself to getting hit by that pimp's book. I had labored with the zeal of a Catholic brother agonizing for the priesthood. I had thought and acted like a black god. And then um, he says that uh, in a pimp's life, yesterday means nothing. It's how you are doing today. 
A pimp's so this is in terms of starting over, right? Mm. A pimp's fame is as fleeting as an icicle under a blowtorch. The young fine <laughs> whores are wild to hump for a pimp and the chips. A pimp in bad shape can't get the time of day from them. A pimp's wardrobe has to be spectacular. His wheels must be expensive and sparkling new. I had to get the gaudy tools to start pimping again. I had memorized an arsenal of howitzer motivators I had kept on instant alert in my skull. I had barraged them daily for three years to persuade a ten host stable to hump my pockets obese. <laughs> oh my god. To hump my pockets obese? That's pretty great, right? Mm, that's pretty yeah. nice. So, <laughs> he, um... He is a magician in that way. Let's be is, real. And yeah. a performer. It's, and it's, a salesman. It's, it's, yeah. so he's not, I can turn sex into money. I can yeah, turn money and, and into I can make my foot disappear up your asshole. I turn sex into money. I don't do the sex. Yeah. Yeah. It is magic. I'm not even doing it. I don't even know how I, I pretty much do nothing. Yes. I mean, other, I mean, other than the manipulation, I mean, yeah. but like, in terms of. Oh, yeah. Other than, <laughs> other than, other than yes. you know. You know. Yeah, I mean, other like, than the burden. I mean, of, he's not booking clients. I mean, he's not no. even like a madam booking clients. Exactly. Or hosting the, the venue. Yeah, I mean, he is there's no really, phone bill. <laughs> truly extorting and manipulating. It's really. Yeah. It is a magic trick. It's the sickest magic trick. It is. Uh, Sick. But I mean, it is. Like, like I said. You know, but here's the thing: is that belonging is belonging, and belonging has value. Yeah, yeah. If you belong to somebody, at least you belong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing too about you know one of the things, the observations that I, I had to stop and go, okay, that's true. Is when uh, Norm Macdonald was talking about the televangelist, and he's like, he's like, you you get salvation for your money, right? Like he's like, let's not act like there's not a product to the person giving the money. There is very much a product, right? But oftentimes they are. Uh, it's not just salvation that they're getting with, like, especially with televangelists. So this is this is my beef with that, because televangelists that are getting money, that's different than tithing at the church. The televangelists that are asking for money, they are asking deliberately poor people. Yeah, like. To send their last dollars to them as seed money. Yes, yes, And that's yes. the sick stuff. Like, giving your money to the church, buying salvation. Okay. Right, but also, a but, woman on the street is definitely as desperate as them. Oh, totally, totally. So, it's the same, in my opinion. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, I was just saying, I was critiquing Norm's opinion. But uh, also, to that person, to that, you know, girl walking the street, belonging is belong- a product. Yeah, there is, an, there is an exchange happening. There is an exchange happening. Um... A place to go, somebody to talk to, at least... And somebody at, who at, will beat somebody's ass. If yeah, yeah, and at, at the very least, the illusion of security. Right. Um, yeah. It's just, so. I mean, it is this fucked up little street family. Yeah. Um, so anyways, he he's starting over. You know that he needs a bankroll, right? He's got to have the clothes, he's got to have the car, all that shit. He's got, he's, got, he's got 20 bucks to his name. And so he's got three choices. He says, I can I can cop some heroin to try and flip that retail, make some money in a few weeks. I can get a prostitute with quote trillions of mileage on her. <laughs> trillions. And work and work her for some scratch for a month until she gives up. <laughs> or three. Until <laughs> <laughs> she gives up. Trillions of mileage. Uh, it's just like buying a race. Trillions. Yeah. Trillions of mileage. Yeah, this is an old horse, but I can run a few races. I've seen it all. You know what you should get out of me is a book. <laughs> <laughs> Moths. Uh, number three. She had a point. I opened a publishing house the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I was turning books into pockets. To a point, I'm nice. Uh, number three. Do a slick, fast hustle. And that's what he chooses. Yeah, you got it. Mean, it just sounds good. I love it slick and fast, baby. Yeah? And so, hustle. So with an accomplice, he attempts uh, a string of robberies of local drug dealers. Smart. Uh, armed robbery was not his strong suit. Not smart. Uh, in the spring of 1947, <laughs> he's arrested. <laughs> he's arrested in the spring of 47, and he's sentenced to a year at the Chicago House of Correction. Uh, this was built in the same year as the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Uh, it was created to house uh, thieves, pickpockets, drunks, and poor people who couldn't um, uh, afford... To pay the fines or hire lawyers? Like yeah, that. poor poor prison. Yeah. yeah, it was considered one of the toughest and out, most out of date prisons in the entire country. Yeah, basically debtor's prison. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. staff was undertrained in modern penal techniques and treated the inmates like indentured servants, oh, working off debts. Like yeah, um, 
It was overcrowded, and, and single-person cells often had two or three people in them. This has a technology from Chicago when the whole city burned down. I can <laughs> smell the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> he said that uh, the conditions were impossible. It was like a prison, only tougher. Um, only cons with scratch are treated like and fed like human beings, so you had their money. Um, the joint was filthy. The food was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> good. Uh, it was good. No, no. The food here is Great. unbelievable. You will die. You have for to. It. You have to get poor and not pay debt. <laughs> the because <official. laughs> <laughs> this place is unbelievable. The officials had an unfunny habit of putting mm. pimps on the coal pile. And um, it's because he was a pimp, they put him on the coal pile there. So what, they had to shovel coal? Shovel coal, coal right? And a roll. he did a week before he like considered, back gave out? He considered escaping. Oh, God. He was like, maybe I could claw up 30 feet of the wall before I get shot. Mm. It, was, it was that bad. And he's just like, I... I, there's a, no way I can handle a year here, especially I, I just got out of Leavenworth and now, and now I'm in this fucking ancient prison in Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. And he goes, no con misses his freedom more than a pimp. His senses are addicted to silky living. <laughs> He's a silky oh, boy. Oh God. Right. So, <laughs> as he says in, in pimp, uh, after, after uh, weeks of, of planning and observation, uh, Good Friday, April 1947. He sets up a dummy in his cell using stolen pants. Nice. A shirt and a sheet for stuffing. He hides in the prison shed until nightfall, climbs up the side of a building, and drops over the 18-foot wall. Whoa. Now, there's no definitive record of this in his FBI file. Um, the, the Freedom of Information request uh, with the Cook County Sheriff does not show anything about this. Um, could be a tall tale. It could be a tall tale. Uh, and there's not, like, and, and even there's some scarcity of the records of his stay there. Well, mm. according to their records, he's still in there. <laughs> the, that's what I'm saying. Like, the records don't even necessarily show that he's there, right? Oh, but, really? Like, it's dubious. But his description of the layout of the prison yard exactly matches the really? official reports. There was a 9 by 12 shed used as a machine shop, which was right next to the coal pile. And, and did he, he try he was, any of the anus in there? <laughs> it wasn't on the menu. It wasn't that kind of prison, man. There weren't puckered anuses well, there. But you said there was pickpockets and yeah. homeless guys and yeah, yeah, donkeys. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like the same crew. But there was no fucking sweet puckered anuses. I mean... So you're saying there was only just unbelievable food <laughs> and no gay shit. There was zagotry and not... I, I, you said it. What, I don't, what, I, what, I, I don't know. Z- you're saying there was Zagat's, Zagat's you're saying restaurant. There. I said there was Zagat's. <laughs> <laughs> Zagat's restaurant. Nice. Guy. I know. Yes. I know. I like now, that. Now, Dublin Delights was uh, in Zagat's, wasn't <laughs> That's it? That's exactly right. So you're a son of a Zagat? <laughs> <laughs> you better be a You're a Zagat pal. legacy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm the future of Zagatry. That's right. I'm a Zaddy. And we got Best Bang for a Buck, so you know what kind oh, of business I'm doing. You are one of them yeah. cheap but sweet <laughs> Zaggins. <laughs> Fellas. He's your Eddie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was a 9 by 12 shed. It was next to a coal pile. All of the other descriptions of his route that he took, like the mess hall, everything that he says is there that way. Yeah. Um, and it matches, it matches like the blueprints. So... In the pimp book, he says uh, that he lived as a, as a fugitive until from this point in 47 to 1961. And he just pretty much skips over a lot. He says, I did a black Houdini to Indiana on Good Friday and uh, pimping in a dozen states. But he leaves a little bit out in the book. In 1947, in the summer, he meets Maddie Cooper, a.k.a. No Thumbs Helen. <laughs> huh? She was a killer pickpocket. Uh, no she thumbs. had no thumbs. Well, she, I mean, some, you know, people with no dexterity are all thumbs. She's no thumbs. Mm. She's all fingers. Mm. Wow. No thumbs, she Helen. All. She was interesting. Uh, she early, early got into a life of crime. Um, started probably when she was about 15. Uh, assault and robbery, possession and sale of narcotics. How can she can possess it. She can't. She has no thumbs. <laughs> How do you think that lobster boy would have done with, <laughs> with all this? Dude. <laughs> Pin- pincer movements? Yeah. <laughs> pincer movements would have been in high demand. Hell dude. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so she she uh, she uh, by the time that she met uh robert um aka iceberg slim uh she had been arrested and booked for uh assault and robbery possession and sale of narcotics disorderly conduct highway robbery disturbing the peace carrying an oversized knife prostitution <laughs> and using profane language uh, Carrying an the, oversized knife is hilarious. They I got um, a big knife and no thumbs. <laughs> All right, get in jails, kid. They they would do little you know cons here and there. Capers. Uh, um, <laughs> That's what little cons are. Capers. They would do some cons here and there, uh, and they got married in Chicago. And what? They moved in with his mom in Milwaukee, where they would live on and off for four years. Get the fuck out! And because of like her being, you know. Um, Handicap. No <laughs> notorious. She also had she was aka Maddie Gray, aka Madeline Roach, aka Maddie LaRoche. Wow. They would go on the road and and just and run cons. Uh um, is she a white woman, black woman? No, she's a black woman. Um there's a picture of her in in this in um Oh pictures. In Justin Gifford's John <laughs> pictures. In Justin Gifford's true biography, uh Street Poison, biography of Ice or Um she, he took her on the road with him in 1948, and um, they would do this thing uh, where and he calls her a magician. Her method of robbery was to uh, stand in an alley and pose as a desperate woman looking for quick sex. She would lurk in some shadowy doorway or alley entrance, and when the trick came by, she'd go into a con act. She'd stand wide-legged and bend her knees to an almost squatting stance. Oh, my God. She'd whip up the front bottom of her dress. She'd expose the gaping hairy magnet to the bugging eyes of the sucker. Holy shit! The pull was magnified Whoa. by her stroking her cat. Oh, oh, God. Once the mark entered the alley and started grinding himself against her, she would expertly unbutton his pants pocket with one hand, take out his wallet with the other, and rob him blind. With both hands behind his neck, she'd remove the scratch from the hide, the wallet. She'd up the sexy chatter and the strong grind against his scrotum. She'd roll up the bills into a tight suppository shape. She'd slip the wallet back into the pocket. She wouldn't forget to rebutton the pocket. And when she was ready to blow the sucker off, she'd get rid of him. She'd crack that she had to pee. And stooping quickly, she'd ram the rolled up bills up her cat. Oh. Pretending to see a vice cop driving down the street. She would then tell the mark to meet her at a local hotel and disappear down the alley to find another sucker. That's pretty good. No thumbs, <laughs> Helen. Yeah. Well, it's really tough when you're just you're trying to pay for something, though. No. no, no what? No, no, they don't have no. thumbprint machines in the 40s. What are you talking about? No, I'm about? saying you got to... I mean, oh, you she's no pull, thumbs. You gotta, you're saying you got to pincer her movement it out. Yeah. She's no you gotta, thumbs. You got to pull. Imagine like, if you had a a, a, a wonderful death. I'm, I'm just saying. No you, thumbs means she's better at finger stuff. No, yeah. but I'm Am saying you're like how? No, no, you're not wrong. How much is how much is that 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 uh, Coca Cola two box? Okay, one second. <laughs> I mean, she's so good. She steals money with the, while she's grinding up against a guy and not even knowing it. I mean, you're, you're, the logic and and, and, the, and the button get the the, the, the button the on button the pocket. Get, it, it's rolled up into that, no, a that, suppository no, that's, shape. That's brilliant. That's what I, that's all brilliant. I'm just saying. The next day, when she's paying for stuff and she's got to pull money out of her pussy. It's oh, just, I don't think she leaves it in there. Hey, Matt. I'm not the expert here. Oh, I don't think she leaves it in there either. No, no, of the, course she I mean, doesn't. Just the it would eat through that paper. Well, you said. I said you, I'm not the expert. I'm you just, said she leaves it in her bacon wallet. I'm just here to ask questions. Bacon wallet? You called it a bacon wallet. <laughs> a bacon wallet? Yeah. I don't think... <laughs> Somebody told me it was called a bacon wallet one time. Oh, I don't God. And I was so disgusted that all my friends thought it was really funny. And then one of my friends bought me a wallet that was that looked like bacon. Oh, man. Just because it was like the most... Dis like I was like... Clearly, like, very horrified by bacon? the bacon wallet. I don't like that. It's really gross. No. It really gross me out. And then my friend Felix bought me a bacon wallet just to, like, further piss me off. Because I was like, that is the stupidest, most... But just, no. no pus nobody's ever called a pussy a bacon wallet. Shut up. Don't like it. <laughs> it's bad. <sighs> so, <laughs> he's with her, uh, you know, on and off for four years. He's with her for about four years. They're They're... Running around the Midwest and shit. Yeah, and God. he, you know, he. I, I think he turns some. He, he pimps her up maybe a little bit, or she. She's doing sex for money, and they're splitting that type of thing. But like, he's a pimp, and he's getting bored with pimping out one woman. 
or, or even just having one, right? This is kind of not his life right now that he, that he's about. And when he tries, but he married her. Right. And she doesn't, she doesn't want to be a part of a stable, but like, she's also a criminal. Like, no, I know. So I she, it. That's it's that that's what they do. They they do crime, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm. But she yeah. didn't want to be part of a stable. She didn't want to compete with any other women. Um, She's an entrepreneur. But when he tries to bring a second woman into the group, uh-oh. uh oh, she attacks them both with the oversized knife she's known for carrying. <laughs> wow! And, and the profanity. Uh, quote: She drew her knife. The young whore fled. I disarmed Helen and punched her around. Helen went to work. I fell asleep. I woke up fast. Helen was jabbing her knife into me. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled away. She had stabbed me in the forearm and the side of an elbow. I took a golf club and knocked her out. <sighs> oh, God. What a bunch of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like the neighbors are fighting again. <laughs> Uh, you guys have to peed off. <laughs> so she really sticks it to him. You know he he kind of he saw the writing on the wall with their relationship, and he stuck around basically long enough to pick up her pickpocketing techniques, and um, he wanted to get rid of her in a way that wouldn't like cause scorn or a vendetta against him by her. She's crazy. <laughs> um, oh, so he showed up with like a dead body. And he's like, well, look, what did you do? <laughs> Is that what he did? did that? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um, From the morgue. They kept hustling. I can't believe you. <laughs> he, they, he would just, they would keep hustling and she, uh, whether because of him or just bad luck, she was arrested during her alley routine. Uh-huh. And this led to just a life of her trying to get straight and going back to prison, her making honest efforts to get straight, getting going back to prison uh, for years. Uh, and uh, in, so sad. in 1956, she was sent to prison for murder. Uh, uh, and that was just some guy. Yeah. Just some guy. How, how'd she do it? Uh, I, I don't know. Probably oversized knife. Probably bacon wallet. Probably a reasonable sized knife. Well, I guess that would work too. Yeah, you, she rehabbed a little bit. Oh, that's right. Yeah, the, 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 well, the it's less not, criminal, the smaller it's, the knife. Well, it's so hard when you don't have any thumbs. It's not, uh, you know, it's it's not the size of the blade. It's the sharpness of. Uh, it's the four, it's the four fingered hand that wields it. You just tape it. Um. So. <laughs> And her name was what again? Maddie Cooper, M A T T. Maddie I-E, Cooper, aka, AKA no, Thumbs AKA Helen, no Thumbs Helen, aka Maddie Gray, aka La Roche. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so around this time, uh, this is like 1950, right? And by the time uh, 1951, when they break up and all that shit. Mm-hmm. Um, Get out of the Midwest. Robert's mother <laughs> and her husband Ural moved to Los Angeles. Well, here's the thing: like the Midwest was where you well, could, Chicago. Yeah, it's where you could be black, but not Indiana. But I mean, maybe he, Indianapolis. I guess I don't but, know. In some places, I suppose. Yeah, but he's not in Indiana right now. Well, but he he had been in Indiana. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but he had been in Illinois. He'd been Rockford, Illinois. He'd been right. in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Been, Chicago actually probably was. But Chicago, no, I think Chicago was. was the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even then, you know, things were changing, right? So um, his, mo- uh, his mother, uh, Mary and Ural, her husband, moved to Los Angeles. Um, they sold her house and um, he left Milwaukee as well. Uh, and then from 51 to 52, he, he said he pimped around the Midwest to the Pacific Northwest. Um, he went to Detroit. And Detroit, he said, was much easier than to get started than back in Chicago because Chicago was kind of flooded. Like the market was flooded there and yeah. it was, you know, the fast track. Um, after a couple of months, like I think it was eight weeks in Detroit, he had got a 17 year old to whore for him. Oh no. And a, a quote, huge black dangerous Jasper who ran her own setup. Jasper's a lesbian mm. and she had her own little mini brothel thing. Really? Yeah. So he's got like a subsidiary. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's diversifying his yeah. portfolio, portfolio yeah. uh, his prostitute portfolio. So mm-hmm. within eight weeks, he was cruising the streets in a new Ford. Jasper for- Industries is a subsidiary of Iceberg <laughs> <laughs> Corporation. Law rights, uh, li- limited liability corporation. Um, he had a new 48 Fleetwood and he had his bankroll. Um, and uh, Detroit was good. I mean, he had, he expanded his stable and he, he learned to exercise self-control. He, he became icy. He wouldn't, 
if, if somebody popped off, he wouldn't beat their ass right mm. away. You know, he would. <clears throat> He grew up. He grew up a little bit, and he used the things that he learned in prison, both from the pimps and and from the, the books. books that he was reading. Yeah. Um, seems like he might be like an art of war kind of guy, too. You know, like that kind of thing. The art of war. Uh, yeah. yeah, the art of war. Very nice, Aaron. But um, I mean, as far as that kind of thing of, you know, dealing with people in and a, being mysterious and not uh, and around. patient with enemies and stuff. You know. Yeah, it's, it's not just a physical, yeah, uh, process with him. You know, he, he had figured out that the, uh, quote, the best pimps keep a steel lid on their emotions. And the, uh, the top pimp gets his payoff for always having the right thing to say to a whore right on lightning tap. So instead of allowing himself to get baited into a fight, you know, losing his cool. Diffusing fight. Right. Mm. He, um. Uh, sating somebody with. The giving them what say. they want. Yeah. He would, then, he would take a, you know, he would just be icy. And he, for example, would respond with something like, listen, square ass bitch, I've never had a whore I couldn't do without. I celebrate, bitch, when a whore leaves me. It gives some worthy bitch a chance to take her place and be a star. You scurvy bitch, if I shit in your face, you gotta love it and open your mouth wide. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's how I talk to John sometimes. Yeah. yeah. He's like a real Eddie Nash, this guy. <laughs> and then I go, I'm not even mad anymore. <laughs> he wow. says the reverse psychology gimmicks worked better than physical abuse, and he made his living in Detroit. This shit pretty, tastes great. Uh, pretty well. Um, and, and this was, and, and like I said, the Midwest was changing. He was in Detroit for a while until quote unquote urban renewal yeah. came through and freeway construction turned the east side of Detroit into a no man's land. Yeah. And this is going to be a pattern throughout the remainder of his pimping career of going to cities and then urban renewal happening. Really? Yeah, I mean... This, like he gets gentrified out of the pimp game? Yeah, and it's not necessarily gentrification, but it's it's on this more industrial... But yeah, for lack of a better word, it's gentrification, except what, it's what not would neighborhoods. Say, what would you say the word actually would be? Urban renewal. Which means... Uh, bulldozing black neighborhoods, putting up high-rises and freeways and projects... And then white people moving to suburbs. Yeah. So it's gentrification on a city or statewide scale. Right. Yeah. But part of the thing too is also white people leaving. Yeah. Right. White, so that's the opposite of gentrification. of gentrification. It is. You know, you're you're right, and the distinction is important, and that's why I wanted to ask. Okay. So I, I guess so. You're saying it's nice parts of town, also projects. Yeah. It's just the, it's the changing of changing of, of neighborhoods of the landscape yeah. of. The, of Entire regions of the country. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. this happens first in Detroit. For him, yeah. But, you know, that happens in, happens in New York, too. Yeah. And- but he wasn't, no, he wasn't no, an East no, Coaster no. guy, right? Oh, no? No. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Don't talk about New York. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm from Long Island, buddy. I think I would have heard about this. Uh, Aaron, do you want me to take a quick break? Let's do it. Okay. And we're back. Now, um, where were we, John? Uh, well, we were. Uh, he, he was back on the street, right? And he was leaving. Uh, leaving Detroit. Detroit, yeah. And uh, he had, um, you know, a little bit of a stable there, and uh, right. the urban renewal right. was, uh, seems to be. Right, it turned uh, the the freeway construction in mm-hmm. Detroit, and the urban renewal, as they call it. Uh, was turning the east side of Detroit, traditionally a uh, black area, uh, into a no man's land. So he uh, he went to Cleveland. That's in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's Good. Interesting twist. Now, Cleveland was popping off. Mm. Yeah? Um, thriving vice scene yeah. in the black district. Well, also, there's a sh- there's been a shit ton of lead and poison in the water f- for decades there. That's right. So, yeah. Whole group of it's whole group of kids. Oh yeah, a whole yeah. group of kids growing up with fucking messed up brains. Yeah, Drew Carey was one of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this man. And everyone during this time who yeah. grew up during this time, lead gas resident included, leaded gas in yeah. the lead it in the air. I mean, yeah. that's why the best job They're was to be a, a gas They're all fucked up and so impulsive pump. because of the so lead. Impulsive. So that was the thing I wanted to bring up. I didn't want to bring up here, but it's another one of those things, kind of like Freakonomics and yeah, and, right. and, and Roe v. Wade stuff. Was a lot of the violent crime. Ticked down too after they took lead out of the gasoline. And they, well, that's a big, that's a big uh, theory. Yeah. Um, yeah, like serial killers uh, were a lot. There were more serial killers then. Mm. And one of the theories is because le- the war and 
the, the war took away their fathers and all the kids had lead gasoline. Uh-huh. In their brains. See what happens? See what happens. So uh, he, he goes to Cleveland and, uh, like I said, thriving vice scene, especially in, in the black part of the town, uh, because there's an unspoken agreement with, uh, with the authorities, white <laughs> authorities, mm. uh, because it served a few purposes. One, it reaffirms racist stereotypes that black people are all criminals and degenerates. Yes. It allows them to demonize the population. Mm. And it also lets them keep a close eye on drugs, prostitution, and gambling without letting it spill into the respectable white right, neighborhood. Right. So it kind of makes sense for them to allow it to be there and not let it be um, m- more decentralized and unobservable or uncontainable. Your hamster dams. That's right. Hmm. I don't know what that is. Yeah, hasn't seen season three yet. Uh, season four. Oh, The Wire? Yeah. Season three. Yeah. Still in the docks. <laughs> <laughs> um, He'll graduate soon. One day. <laughs> Just too busy, you know, Learn, learning about fucking getting street poison, pimp culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, black detective novelist Chester Himes, legendary black novelist, uh, he grew up in Cleveland around this time, and he wrote of Cleveland's vice district in the opening of his autobiography. And I want to just describe it to you. He grew up in uh, Cleveland during the the 20s and 30s, and he was fascinated with the whorehouses and prohibition speakeasies uh, along the infamous Scoville Avenue, known as the Bucket of Blood. And um, it kind of continued uh, being this way, and, and even more so into the 40s and 50s. And he wrote... That Scoville Avenue ran from 55th Street to 14th Street on the edge of the Black Ghetto and was the most degraded slum street I had ever seen. The police once estimated that there were 1,500 black prostitutes cruising the 40 blocks of Scoville Avenue at one time. The black whores on Scoville, for the most part, were past their 30s, vulgar, scarred, dim-witted, in many instances without teeth, Mm. diseased, and poverty-stricken. Most of the black men in the neighborhood lived on the earnings of the whores and robbed the hunkies, Hungarian immigrants, they gambled for small change, fought, drank poisonous white mule, cut each other up, and died in the gutters. It was nothing unusual to see a black man lying in the gutter, drunk and bleeding and dying. Wow. Yikes. Slim thrived here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I found my place. <laughs> this would be the best pimping of his career. <laughs> it's like, it's like, he's like playing for, you know, play for the Yankees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He had women uh, humping for him in Cleveland and also neighboring Toledo. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a strict regimen of going to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't very much of a drinker. Uh, uh, had a strict regimen of going to bed early and getting up before his women did. Um, uh, he kept his clothes tight and his, his beauty regimen was better than theirs. He would often wake up uh, and get, get to his bottom woman's apartment fully dressed, looking immaculate before she even woke up and just kind of giving this, you know, this air of control, control and dominance. He said that, um, Oh gosh. He said, uh, I'd be sitting there like a field marshal. You see all impeccable. I might even have gone down to the barber shop and gotten myself all refurbished everything. And there she found me, the gentleman who had gotten slightly sweaty, sweaty with her during the night, perhaps, but I'd recouped, you see, and I was still flawless infallible Jehovah that I was when we got in bed. <laughs> wow. Um, christ But even, even with this uh, incredible second act of his career, you know, he's in his 30s now, mm-hmm. which is getting up there for a pimp. Yeah. And he's having a wonderful second act. Making money. Uh, still having nightmares. Wow. Still having those nightmares. Still having new nightmares. Uh, after one of his uh, prostitutes died with a burst appendix, uh-huh. new nightmares were added to the old ones. You know the one where he's beating the shit out of his mom and stuff? Yeah. He said, I used to dream that there would be puffy, green-streaked bladders, oh, and they God. would be rushing in chaos, and I had a subjective attachment to them because I was fearful that they would collide. They were all tied into my own existence. So he starts using cocaine again. 
Uh, but this time he adds heroin. So he starts doing speed balls. Oh, oh yikes. No, you don't worry about sleep. And he, and he said, um, I got sound sleep. <laughs> and I never had, I didn't have those bad dreams and I got hooked on H. Did, but it didn't worry me because I had a lot of money. I had a long scratch. Wow. Uh, but then urban renewal came for Cleveland as well. Mm. And uh, they cracked down on the scene. Uh, and so he left for Seattle. And um, damn, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned earlier that he he would uh, pimp a little bit around the Midwest and move eventually to the the Pacific Northwest. But you don't to think of that. Yeah. So you don't think of Seattle that way. But for m- more reasons than one, Seattle at this time would get a reputation of being a wide open town. Mm. Um, you know, the changes in the country we're going to eventually alter the pimp game and uh, the entire country in general. Um, but there was a post-war economic boom, uh, or, but there was a lot of industry there where that black men could work and make money. Hmm. Um, and they were, they could make more money there than in the Midwest, which originally was a place where black men could make more money than the South. So there was this kind of second great migration to the West Pacific Northwest and the West coast. Um, Boeing was there. Sears was there and they were paying livable wages um, Mm -hmm. more than more than they were paying black men in other parts of the country. Um, But during this time, you start seeing the tide of culture change to a more integrated society. Brown versus the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Desegregation of schools. Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on a bus to a white man whole civil rights movement is starting and and he's in Seattle for all that he's in Seattle for much of this right huh and then like I mentioned post-war economic boom increasing availability of all consumer goods and mass culture TV everyone is seeing you know a young one you know um Everybody knows I love Lucy. Yeah, everyone knows. Everyone knows. Everyone's seeing like the how the rich, how rich people really live. It's everyone's getting TV. Everyone, you know, before before this, everything was just kind of a, an abstraction. So it was much easier for pimps to run a con on young girls by saying that they were fucking super rich and they had the ticket to to fame and fortune. They could, mm-hmm. you know, they would buy looms of fabric and staple them to the wall of their hotel room and say that, you know, their place is covered in, in velvet and yeah. shit like that, you know, but because they were, they would you know they were none the wiser, but now as baby bell said it earlier, you know, when, when the economy is good, it's a nightmare for a pimp mm. because there's not desperate young girls trying to make money. Right. So now the economy is booming there's an influx of every the shoe shiners had a Cadillac, you know? So everyone, it was just, everyone was doing better. So the pimp game was changing because now your shit's not that special. I can one, anyone can get a Cadillac. Everyone's getting a car in the fifties, right? Yeah. You can, yeah, you can get a and, job. So. And you're, I can tell you're fake rich. You're hood rich. This isn't real. You, mm-hmm. you know, you live with your mom, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so and, was, the, and the American dream is more attainable. And it's and now it's a, it's almost a monoculture. Bef- yeah. Integration happened, right? And although you know, there will be still before busing and all that stuff is, is still yet to come, but you're starting to see it happen. Yes. Right? Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier and all that stuff. So it's starting to happen, and now it's harder to run the con. So the old school pimp game is, is dying out. Um, so he leaves, uh, he leaves, um, Seattle because he sees the writing on the wall there. It's no longer a wide open town. Um, the, those war industries like, like Boeing and then even just, you know, retail like Sears or Safeway, every, everyone's making, a, doing a little bit better for themselves. Rising tide lifts all, all ships, right? Even black ones. And so he leaves, he leaves Seattle to go back to Chicago one last time. Um, and, he, and he's going he, to rethink the game because he's getting older. He has to get smarter. He can't, he can't gorilla pimp. He can't. He's got to get better in the way he does it. So he kicks heroin. He has a friend lock him in a room for a few weeks. Damn. And he slowly lowers his dose. And he's like, Dude. Oh, okay. That just cold. That's yeah, yeah. Smart, he slowly smart. lowers it over the course of a few weeks. And he still says it like, if you've ever had the flu, multiply times a thousand. Still with reduced. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> so it's getting a little. It's still that bad. Yeah. Wow. Um, Jesus. In Chicago, he he had a couple women. Ooh, the flag's falling. Here. <laughs> he had a couple women of in in his uh, employ, as it were, um, in town. He also had a, a couple in a brothel in Montana. Oh, nice. And so he's they working. They it there. It, well, I mean, <laughs> Bad. I think we talked about Bad, it in baby. one of one of Matt's episodes. Montana has a rich history of brothels. I think Good Time Party Girl, she ran a brothel in Montana. Montana, Montana has mm. had like high class or, or lots of and very good brothels since like the Civil War. Yeah. Um, so he had a couple of women in a, in a brothel there just mailing him money. So he's now, he, in his old age, in the twilight of his pimping career, he's working smarter, not harder. Yeah. Um, Through I, the big sky. <laughs> <laughs> big sky, Montana? Yeah. Got it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just cracking open this fine nice. butt wiper. This is oh. butt, butt wiper, the king of beers. That's really good stuff. Mmm. Mm, you like that? We can really taste the piss. Yeah. Mm. So I said he's um, working smarter, not harder, mm-hmm. doing all right. But now he's forty. Yeah, and now he's in heroin. No, he's or, kicked, uh, it. He's uh, kicked uh, it. All right, but 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 even before that, you said he looked kind of like shit, and and then he added the heroin habit, and he looks a little long in the tooth for a pimp. And, and forty for a pimp is ancient now. Like yeah. he looked long in the tooth at thirty. Yeah. To his own vain standards. I mean, yeah. he's still all right looking. Um, I'm wearing the shirt right now. This is an iceberg yeah. pimp shirt. Can you guys see? Yeah, it? I can uh, see. How old is he in that picture? Twenty, uh, early twenties. Yeah, he's probably in his late twenties. This is probably right after he got out of prison, in, like when he was twenty eight, twenty nine. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Uh, he um. He's old. And yeah, he, he, he knows he, you know, he's old and pimp years and he knows that his career is coming to an end, but he doesn't, he's kind of surprised in the way it happens. In 1961, he's arrested <laughs> in South Park on South Park Avenue in Chicago for an outstanding warrant for a prison escape. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> that sucks. So then it is proven. It is proven. Ah. So, I mean, he was held for a man. month at Cook County Jail, where he'd been before, mm-hmm. and then sentenced to 10 months at Chicago House of Corrections. Now, Chicago House of Corrections. Is that the tower? No, I don't, oh. think, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it is a nightmare. <laughs> it doesn't sound like any of them are. He uh, was placed. in Sweden. He was placed in a tiny cell, not meant for long-term incarceration. Quote, it was a tight box designed to crush and torture the human spirit. I raised my arms above me. My fingertips touched the cold steel ceiling. I stretched them out to the side. I touched the steel walls. I walked seven feet or so from the bar door to the rear of the cell. I passed the steel cot. The mattress cover was stained and stinking from old puke and crap. The toilet and <laughs> wash bowls were encrusted with greenish brown crud. The Chicago House of Correction was built just a few years after the Civil War, so it was even older than the last shithole he was this in. This one survived the Chicago Fire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll be safe. here. No windows, and some of the cells still use slop buckets for toilets. Oh, Fuck Christ. God. Most of these uh, cells were designed for prisoners to spend maybe one or two nights. Um... But uh, prison officials were cruel and sometimes used them to punish uh, uncooperative or dangerous inmates. He was in that cell for nearly a year. Yikes. Uh, basically solitary. Yeah. Uh, and he, he says he witnessed things that almost drove him crazy here. A con on the row blew his top one night around midnight. He woke up the whole cell house. At first he was cursing God and his mother... The screws, the COs, brought him past my cell. In my state, the sight of him almost took me into madness. He was buck naked and jabbering a weird madman's language through the foamy jib. A foamy jib is your mouth. It was like it was like talking in tongues, holy rollers do. He was jacking off his stiff swipe, stiff swipe with both hands. Both hands. Two both hands. hands. He needs two hands. Now that's nice. <laughs> he had to draw upon all of his discipline and the screen theory. Uh, you know, controlling the movies that play in your mind. 
Oh, I don't know. He had a drop. But we, he, we, in the, talked in the, the, we talked about it in the last episode. You know, you're in control of the movies that play oh, in your mind. Oh, right, right, right. right. That's I'm screen sorry. theory yes, is yes, what yes. we call it. Right. And, Unless so he, you're asleep. And then your head movies. <laughs> in my head movies. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah, you're right. That's, that's why you don't sleep, man. <laughs> um, so he, he in his, in his um, you know, his knowledge of um, psychotherapy and psychiatry, he kind of acted as his own therapist and he you know when he when he started to hear voices he remembered reading that hearing voices is, means you're starting to lose your mind and so he was like all right i gotta get my shit together and so he um he did something called writing on the ceiling and um he would lay on his cot and look at the ceiling and start like reenacting uh scenes from his past Wow, and all, and and basically writing them out, like imagining them, acting them out, and then writing them out on the ceiling, and it was his way of staying sane. Wow, um, and then, crazy man, That's yeah, and this fucking and it, crazy. So, I mean, it's, it sounds like a good trick to. He, he said, that, yeah, I mean, cope, coping mechanisms are sometimes just as simple as laying it out and not having a go around like a stew in your head. Yeah. Well, and I mean, something, um, it reminds me of my, I had a great uncle who was in a Japanese internment camp and he would get, take matchbooks and he would write every word that he could think of that began with a letter. On yeah. Them. Mm. And he, that's how he stayed safe. Yeah. Wow. You just got to do something. And in doing this, writing on the ceiling and doing his own kind of psycho evaluation, psychiatric evaluation of himself, he um he decided he was going to quit pimping forever. He he kind of reconciled why he was having these dreams about his mother. And um his mom was he knew that his mom was kind of deteriorating in her condition at this point she had diabetes and all this shit. Yeah. And um he was going to kick the pimp game for sure there and this writing on the ceiling all this therapy and stuff kind of um honed his talent mm -hmm. even more for storytelling and wordplay and when at the end of his term when when the prison authorities were going to um renege on his good time like one month good time he wrote a letter to the warden he wrote his way out of jail early and it's mm. pretty good um and it's it's the only letter it's the only document from his incarceration in the Chicago House of Corrections survives. And I'll read some of it. Okay. All right? You kind of get, this is like the first thing he's ever, that we, we have that he's written. It's before yeah. the books. Other yeah. than I could read to you, a, there's a picture of him and No Thumbs Helen that he has a caption on. Maybe I'll save that for Patreon. Yeah. Remind me for that. Okay. This, is, this is the letter he, write, he writes to the, the administration. Dear Warden, I've seen your wife. I'm going to shit in your mouth. Open she, she begged me to stay. <laughs> Sir. This guy's got a word. I have requested to see you on several occasions in the recent past as to the vital importance of my legal release date. I had attributed your failure to call me for interview to the press of a busy schedule. Now that I have by personal device managed to see you, I shall be as brief and as clear as possible. Sir, I am confused and puzzled as to what methods you employ in the awarding of good time. I will be most grateful to you if you will clarify your criterion which determines who is and who is not entitled to good time. I am sure that you are an able man for your position, and as such, you surely must be aware that one of the vital precepts of effective penology is that good time is always given to those who good conduct deserves it. Sir, in short, why in the face of my impeccable conduct has my good time been taken? Sir... I have heard very recently a most unpleasant rumor to the effect that good time is sometimes unfairly given or not given on the basis of not merit but of skin color. This rumor, because of my faith in you as a just man, I had discounted as utterly fantastic. Sir, another matter which is not less important to me is the failure of your record room to post on its ledger 60 days to my credit which had been given to me in court last June 13th by Judge Butler. A friend of mine has researched this matter for me, and the result is that aside from Judge Butler's dictum that I have yet a stronger legal support to my 60 days claim, I refer specifically to the fact that Mr. Churchill, an accredited and authorized member of the House of Corrections, officially, official family, had executed and performed my arrest as a member of your staff. 
In brief, my contention is simply that if Captain Churchill had taken me to such an unlikely location as a basement in, in Skokie and held me there for two months instead of in county jail as was done, the legal effect would still be the same. My sentence started at the instant that the captain arrested me. Now, sir, if I am not released on schedule... The prospect of civil experiment I find most attractive. In closing, I must say I realize that mine is a tiny voice crying in the wilderness, but it is historical fact that even a tiny voice can often bring cataclysmic change. Thank you for your time. <laughs> he lets him out. Wow. Sir. Wow. You know, semi-veiled threats, legal arguments, a, a, a rhythm that is cutting... Yes, uh, yes, it builds one up while... Cutting them down. Cutting he them down. He pimped the war. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he gets his good time and gets to let out. Um, and now where's party time during all this? I think he's jacking off his tip swipe. <laughs> tip swipe. <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> <laughs> he's got... <laughs> so he's, he's released for the last time in 1962, and he leaves the game behind forever. Um, like I said, his mom is bedridden. Um, Ural, uh, Ural Beck, her husband, uh, has died. Um, he, he's, he gets out of that 10 months of solitary. Um, he said, I think he says a, a shell of his former self. Um, it nearly drove him mad. Yeah. Tremendously psychologically damaging. He, he lost 30 pounds. And uh, and has like that grew a scraggly ass beard, um, and and he he goes back to Chicago. Oh, I mean, he's in Chicago, but as he leaves, he has um, this bittersweet farewell to the city and to the game. Uh, that I just want to read because it's it's just you know it's it's so alien but also so relatable. Mm. Let's see if I can find this here. Um, you know, most of the pimps at this time, so it's April 1962, and he had made a promise to himself and, and eventually to will to his mother that he's, he's, he's straightening up. Um, but, you know, most of the pimps that he, he had known were either dead or drunk buffoons in a gutter. Um, <sighs> Baby Bell... Remember Baby Bell? Still, of course, yeah. Baby Bell, um, no longer a baby. No longer, man. Never Bell. was toddler Bell. He <laughs> had walked over to Chicago's Washington Square Park and uh, shot himself in the temple. Jesus Christ! Left a note. Goodbye, squares. <laughs> Kiss my pimping ass. Oh, oh, that's so. Adi- oh, Aaron. That's, oh God, that makes me so happy. I know how much you love last words. I love last Goodbye words. Squares, Goodbye squares, comma. Kiss my pimping ass. Kiss my ass. Pimpin ass. <laughs> Shut himself in the temple. I'm going out how I want to go. Fearless. Goodbye squares. Sorry you guys couldn't be cool for five <laughs> minutes. Zagats. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't get it. He um. <laughs> he didn't want to suffer the same fate to either kill himself or. Be dead from other means, or be a drunk bum. To became a square, um, and he's probably very uh, inspired by the success of his writing campaign. I mean, to, to be released, and so now he's thinking, what else non traditionally can I pimp? Yes, um, it, there's a little bit of time before. I mean, his main thing is is getting right with himself and his mother first before he gets there but it is you're not wrong but there's a little bit of time here because he, he really wants to reconcile with his mom that was the big thing that was his kind of breakthrough that he had first with dr crumb beagle and yeah. then in his the ceiling of his his six by ten cell was like shit i was just, man these nightmares are happening for a reason right you know he was uh, past 40 now um he had blown his bottom woman he no longer has the finery for for seducing young victims um he he reflected. This is before his, right before he leaves. He he says, um, "I was caught in the nightmare bind that an older pimp faces past the age of thirty-five. He is then prone to many setbacks and disasters. Any one of them can put him on his uppers, and without any one of them can put him on his uppers, and without the basic gaudy bait, 
like an out-of-sight car, a psychedelic wardrobe, the diamonds necessary to hook and enslave a fresh stable of humping young whores. And then, you know, he gets out, and he says, the clothes flopped around on my skeletal frame because he lost 30 pounds, right? Yeah. And he just, he, he walked back to the city because he hadn't done, he hadn't walked, you know, he just, I'm just going to walk back to the city. Yeah. So at, getting, at the beginning, it's got to feel like a liberating oh, walk. Gift, and, and, gift. and then at the end of it, you're like, fucking God, yeah, he, I'm, I don't have any muscles. Yeah. He walked the, the six or seven miles back into town and he, he wasn't planning to do it. He just like, I walked out and I just, I just kept going, yeah. you know, and he went to a barbershop and got a haircut and a mud nice. massage, hoping to maybe look a little bit fresher, you know? Oh, nice. And like, I, I only, all I could think was that I looked like my own grandpa. Wow. <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure during that haircut, he was like, who the fuck <sighs> is this guy? Who the fuck is this man? This square. <laughs> um, and he, as he said goodbye to the last woman that worked for him when he's leaving Chicago, he said, I felt a stab of regret that I was leaving her forever back there. But then the pain was gone and the great relief of my smooth exit from her and the terrible emptiness of the pimp game. And it was good to realize that I would no longer brutalize and exploit black women. Wow. So he um wow. he goes he goes to LA, moves in with his mom, who is bedridden and alone. Um and she's not doing hot so hot. Yeah. I mean bedridden and alone, but like really suffering. But he buys her a nice outfit and puts her on the street. Oh yeah, it makes her <laughs> get, it gives her a reason to live. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucked up. <laughs> so there can't be a bottom if there's only one. They would. Uh, this he really reconciles with his mom with his mom here. Really? Yeah. Um, they would lie in in two twin beds next to each other and talk all night. And she oh like admits like, hey, I did fucked up shit. Like, or I mean, or I, mean, I think he. It was more that he realized that perhaps he over blew. The, really the only mistake that she ever made. Right. I mean, she's still letting him live with her and stuff yeah. all the times he came out of prison. Like, she, and, and he says, like, you know, she was really a good woman. And I just really resented her for the trauma that her her mistake caused me. I mean, she was a young woman when that happened. Yes. And also the and circumstances a, that she's forced into by virtue of being a black yeah, woman in tricked. that time. And then you go like, all right, well, that wasn't really you neglecting me, but it was it was really society neglecting us, yeah, and, and forcing you into that kind of position, right? And if you had any, and, and even then, like, she got tricked by an asshole, sure, you yeah, know? yeah, that's and and abused, too. and she tried, you know, she tried after that, you know, yeah, and and um, he 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 reconciled with her, and he made a promise to clean up as he was already, he'd already kick, kick drugs and stuff and start a family. Um, and you know, he has never been on a date before. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> He's a 40 year old man who has never had a real relationship. Yeah. I don't or, pick at the bill. Or how does uh, this work? Uh, never been on a date. All he, all he knew was pipping, right? And so he's like, well, I'm going to do what I know. And so he polishes up her Chrysler like shines it up, shines his shoes, puts on like this is hundred degree heat in LA, puts on like a fucking twelve piece suit, you know, and um, you know down to like you know he would always iron his pants with a thick, little fat crease down the front, and um, he would he'd go out and he, he said I'll you know I'll go to diners and look for a, a waitress or a working girl that would then make a suitable bride. And so, in 1962, 1963, he um, he goes to this burger joint in mm. LA. McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he meets the immediacy of the yeah is so good. Yeah. <laughs> he meets. Got him. He meets 26 year old Betty Mayshew. Huh. She was born February 25th. My birthday. <laughs> um, white girl. Uh, and she, she had just left Austin, Texas uh, after falling out with her mother. Mm. And she moved to L.A. And she tracked down her father, who had been estranged, uh, in Ventura, California. About an uh, hour, hour, Ventura. Hour, hour or another so. Uh, she goes to see him. He's now an alcoholic and tries to rape her. Jesus Christ. Mm. So she goes back to L.A. And she starts... 
She doesn't have any money. She's basically living out. She's homeless, pretty much, living in a car. And um, she starts working for and eventually living with uh, an elderly black couple who ran this burger stand in South Central. Wow. She started working for them, and when they saw that she was like living there, they offered her. To, they she, they offered her to stay in the room with their daughter, like in another in, a, in another bed. Like, That's they so were they sweet. were That's really sweet, really really good people to her. Yeah. Um. And he would uh, he went to this burger stand, and he would just he all he, he didn't know how to like approach women or talk. <laughs> yeah. he, would, he knew how to stalk them. <laughs> Yeah. And I don't mean like stock, like a, I mean just like like stalking your prey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then finding out, you know, more about them, and then like, you know, right. the, the whole the whole thing of being trained about uh, find out their trauma. Right. right. But, but yeah, he was stuff. still determined in a way to counteract it. Not be a pimp, but try and use these evil skills for good somehow. Right. So. Well, he knew what he wanted, and could he get it without being totally exploitative and abusive <laughs> and brutal? <laughs> yeah. And so he would go and he'd, he'd sit there and he'd get a burger and fries and seven up and she would bring it out and, you know, uh, she would get like hit on by other guys there and he'd be like, man, can't you see she's just trying to work? And he would just do that all the time, like just defend this cute blonde chick from, uh, I don't think she was blonde, but cute white girl from Texas mm -hmm. and just defend her from these guys, you know, fucking perving out on her all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um... He would never, and then he would just finish his burger, and he'd bring her the the you know little basket of stuff, and and just say, "Thank you, miss, and you know I'll see you tomorrow, dear." And he did that for a while, and then until one day at the end, after defending you know her again from another fucking asshole, mm -hmm. he said, "You know, uh, I, would one of these days would you let me take you to a place where you could eat some real food besides a hamburger?" And she says, "Like what?" And he goes, "Like soul food," and she was like. And in later interviews, she's like, you know what? I lived with black people. I like black music. I like black food. And then this strange older black man comes and he's got a car shiner than the shiny shoes he's wearing. And he's driving. He looked like, I don't know if it was a doctor or a lawyer or something, but like this just, and he was really nice to me. So I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, they go out, they go to a soul food place. Um, then they go to a, like a diner. And, uh, and this was like when they had, um, you know, jukeboxes, right? So he would give her a nickel and she would walk him, play the jukebox and come back. And they would give her another one. And, you know, and, and she'd be like, what, will you just give me a quarter? Like, and I could just play five songs. He's like, it's like, uh, I like the way everybody here looks at you when you get up to go pick a song. Mm. It's, still, it's still, it's still pimping. Right. But not in like, <laughs> but it's not but he's pimping, not like, pimping. shit in your mouth, bitch. He's, but, but he's just being yeah. smooth. I right? mean, yeah. you know, the, uh, he's not watching. I mean, he the... is, she is getting up and walking. Sure, sure, sure. But, um, you know, Tiger out of the jungle. Jungle out right. of the tiger. That's racist. Wait, what did you say, dude? Tiger out of the jungle. Jungle out of the tiger, you know? You can't take... Yeah. You take the tiger of the jungle, but you can't take the jungle of the tiger. That's really racist. What about the what about the the white tigers up in in uh <laughs> what is wait, Siberia? No, wait, no, no. I was gonna say up in Vegas in the in oh, the yeah. in the, the Siegfried yeah. uh, Tower. You can take the tiger out of Siegfried. <laughs> but you can't take, you can't take Siegfried you can't, out of the tiger. No, because he's in there for good. <laughs> he should have <laughs> too. <laughs> or Roy. You think you killed me, but I'm in your head forever, dude. Every time you're riding a bike, you're thinking about old Siegfried. <laughs> You couldn't kill me. <laughs> I ended up. You ate me. Now I'm a part of you. Uh, I'm a, I'm pimping you from the afterlife. You fucking dumb fuck. I'm your Tyler Durden. <laughs> Tiger. I'm your Tiger Durden. Tiger Durden. Durden. Oh. <laughs> Tiger Durden. Yeah. You set it up. Dude. That's pretty cool. You set it yeah. up. No, I like it. It's yeah, really no, good. You like it. You always enjoy a really dumb pun. Especially if I come up with <laughs> Especially if you have you. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't come work. up with it. I didn't come up with it. I'm going to start talking about Siegfried Tower. I know. You're right. You're, you're, I'm, you're I'm, the brains, I'm the brains, yeah, you're the of, the brains of this. I, what, I, what would I do without you? <laughs> See how I'm pimping? Nothing. See how I'm pimping? Oh. He's sick. So uh, then they go to a, a nightclub. Hey, all right. And you know he drinks Seven Up because he doesn't drink any drugs anymore. And um, <laughs> she's drinking. She has some whiskeys, and then she drinks some other people's whiskeys. And uh oh, she's getting pretty lit up. Oh and no! And then this she, they're in the car, and he's in the Chrysler that he put a record player in because he's still a pimp. That's really Smart nice. Move. Yeah, good. And, uh, no, no bumps. No bumps. No bumps. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she pukes. And she's puking really bad. And so in the Chrysler, 
Well, out of it. That's going to mess up that shine. And then, um, so he takes her to the ER. And she goes back there and they like pump her stomach or whatever. And oh, God. they run some tests and she finds out she's three months pregnant. Oh, God. And she's out. She's freaking out. I mean, she's on the first date with this guy and, you know, she finds. And he's like, she's like, I, she's like I've how had do my, I not exploit this? She was like, <laughs> she was like, I, I didn't, you would never have guessed that I was two or three months pregnant. I was having my period. I just, this is impossible. I'm like, no, you're pregnant. And she's like, I can't do this. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he's like, what do you mean? And she's like, I, how am I going to, what am I, I don't have anybody to take care of me. He's like, oh, I'll take care of you. And he does. And she moves in with him and his mom. No shit. Yeah. Um, and Who's out there? <laughs> she still doesn't know what he. She just still doesn't. She's not know right what, on the ceiling, is she? She's Betty. Um, doesn't know his past yet. He's just this sweet. That's her name, is Betty. Yeah, yeah. Betty Mayshu. And um, a little uh, you know, the first few days, his mom warns her to leave. She's like, wow. she's talking shit about her. You're in the jungle now, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you, know <laughs> you can take the Siegfried out the tiger. But you can't but take you Siegfried can't. out of Roy, I'll tell you that. <laughs> they, they like being in. <laughs> but uh, she story. doesn't she doesn't leave. Um and they they <laughs> Um And they they eventually uh they get their own they get their own place. And then his mom dies. And Betty says she has never seen anybody in more pain in her entire life. Oh. Than Robert, when Robert Iceberg Slim's mom dies. Wow. She's like, I, it was, uh, he was inconsolable. Wow. Um, and it's just kind of, you know, you have all the, whatever, you know, trauma and 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 the uh, underlying hatred or, or uh, resentment that you have from it, it's still feeling, right? So it's still involvement. It's involvement, involvement investment, yeah. and so whenever, even after, you, I'm, I'm sure that even if he'd never reconciled with her, he would still have been wrecked by her death. Right. And but. then uh, probably even more so that he did reconcile with her because mm-hmm. he, you know he, they spent so much time before yeah. she died, but. Whatever that, um, you know, it's it's like you know, enemy showing up to your funeral type of thing, you know. But uh, you know, it's it it's 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 like a twilight zone type of thing where, after all of this time and all of this trouble, they finally they both him and his mom are both past it, and now she can go. They're cool. Yeah. And then, but there's, she's just there's still, not enough time. Still telling Betty, you gotta get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, he, he said that him moving back in with her in LA, pro- it, it, it bought her like six months more life. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I believe that. And uh, the other thing is that with a lot of these relationships, too, like, uh, you know, the headlines are always the bad shit. Yeah. But you always know underneath, there's still these very good, uh, enriching, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, soul replenishing times uh, that, that 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 they don't rise to the top when you, you think about. You don't the know the headlines because you know so much more about them. You had such a more yeah, thorough but the, relationship. But the headlines, I think, are, is just like the bad shit that you're mad about because that yeah. has like traction. Yeah, the good stuff is just there and makes you feel at peace. Yeah, and and you, and, well, and, it, and it, it's it's only really when somebody is gone that I think you reflect on those times and then go yeah. like, oh yeah, fuck, all that shit was great. Yeah. So I think that's part of the pain is that you don't know what you got till it's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You still see somebody and you still see all this hurt and, and all this shit. And then like the moment they're gone, you're like, ah, oh, fuck man. Remember this fucking one time that was like nothing happened. And we just had a nice night. <laughs> yeah. And, and you you know, know? He, in general, you know, he didn't have a, a conscious hatred of his mother. No, no, but you, you get caught up in your own narrative. Right. And mm-hmm. then especially yeah. as he's reconciling and in prison through therapy, he's like, oh shit, man, a lot of this stuff was about my mom. Like yeah. all those dreams, it was unconscious. It was subconscious for him. That's why it came out in his dreams. Yeah. But in general, he always, anytime he got out of prison or jail, he went back and stayed with his mom for yeah. a week and he visited her all the time. Like they yeah. did have 
they were close. And yeah. he says, you know, as we talked about in the in the Patreon in the previous part one, you know, he said he was he wasn't an inherently good pimp like all the others because he didn't hate his mom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but having that, and that's what was I think, and that's why he did, and it was important for him to see her off and and make good on his promise to her of uh, mm-hmm. being clean kicking the game and and starting a family and also uh, ultimately talking about the shit yeah. yeah because guys like baby bell were never going to write this book no to the point of being like hey here's all the shit i did and it's wrong yeah. no baby bell killed himself to avoid yeah that <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah kiss my pimp and ass <laughs> yeah. uh you know goodbye uh, square <laughs> iceberg, iceberg slim still has enough uh, uh, uh gentleness in his life that at the end of it it allows him to go forward and Yep. And be like, yeah, this was bad and dysfunctional. Yeah, it's um, and he, and he really, he really does, you know, g- uh, do everything in his power to be legit. Um, you know, he's living with Betty. She's pregnant with God knows whose kid. Yeah, some burger baby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that works. Dr. Crumbeager? <laughs> A Crumburger? Crumbeager. <laughs> um, he, he, um, he, um, he takes a job for an exterminator company, mm. like door to door type of thing. But he's like, man, I'm a fucking hustler. Fuck this. So he makes his own business card. He takes the shit, makes his own business the card. The equipment. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And he just makes his own business card going around. And so he doesn't have to give half of it. He's like, I, don't, I know what I'm getting pimped. I'm fuck this. I'm going to do it <laughs> yeah, on his own. Yeah, so he does it yeah. on his own. Start spraying arrogance in people's faces. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, you know, LA was comparatively a pretty, uh, you know, he, he had even said like they treat black people who are better than any other city I've ever been to. Right? Yeah. But even then LA was segregated. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still, you know, still the white, white homeowners associations and mm-hmm. very tied into the KKK and white flight in LA and all this. Yeah. Stuff. So, um, you know, he it was, is. It is important to say though that the difference is still quite a bit, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, L.A. from other cities, East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, it was and to this day, you'll hear the same thing from people. From I immediately saw a difference when I moved out here, and I met black folks that grew up on the West Coast, and I was like, I can immediately tell. Oh, white people have been nicer to you for longer here than, and, and, and we we have a mutual friend where uh you know he was saying like he's like my parents were like super fucking like black power uh-huh. in Philadelphia and they sent me out here to be like here is a better place to get used to white people mm-hmm. and he sounds and, and 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 yeah and and he's right though I mean yeah. his parents were right yeah um it is it's different it's. Still not, it's not perfect no, by any no, stretch no. of the imagination. Right. But there is a general, um, I would say, a better attitude yeah. uh, from the average uh, white people out here. Um, so, like I said, he does the exterminator thing. And that, and, and that was the only sales job he could get. You know, he, because of who he was, not a pimp, just a black man. You know, he, even in L.A., he was not considered for more professional, even more professional sales jobs. And so this guy could sell ice to an Eskimo, right? Yeah. Like this guy convinced scores of women to go have sex and bring him the money. Yeah. But he, he wasn't making any inroads, uh, for the, for these more professional jobs. Right. Um, and he was feeling defeated, you know, he's in his forties. He doesn't look like he used to. And, and he's in a new city and a new, completely new world in terms of legit, professions right and so he like confesses to betty and he says that um i ain't never ever going to be accepted in the white world and you also have to realize that you will never ever be accepted in the black world but you stand a better chance than i do because white men hate the fact that a black man is fucking one of their women they just don't do that so we will never be able to live anywhere except on the outskirts of the ghetto where there is a mixture of people and that's kind of how it is for a while. Um, she has a kid, Robin Bell. He takes his mother's last name, Beck. 
Wow. So he was born Robert Moppins, and he went by Lancaster Slim or Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh Slim, and he changed his name. He took his, his when his mother married Ural Beck. Now you're saying Robert did. Robert took Beck. not the child, right? Yes. Robert took Beck, and then Robin Bell, his this child that's not his. He named Robin Bell after Baby Bell. Wow. <laughs> so Robin Bell Beck. Oh, damn. Ah. Yeah. So both, like, the surname and the middle name are both after the, some of the two most important people in his life. Yeah. Two totally opposite type of people, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would take party time, so it would be John Boy time, Fahey. That'd be mine. Yeah? Yeah. That's what it is now. <laughs> yeah, you said it. <laughs> yeah, said man. It, man. <laughs> what? Hey, I never even thought about that. Um, he gives Betty his mother's <laughs> ring. You can take the John boy out of the party. <laughs> you can take John out of the boy, but you can't. <laughs> what? Huh? He's like, what? Dad, why is my middle name party? He's like, In college, they're going to love that. Just <laughs> I'm prepping you. <laughs> um, it's really good. We have a friend who's, uh, they name their middle name, their baby's middle name is et cetera. Yeah. That's exactly That's right. That's one of them, yeah. yeah. That's friend of the show. Friend of wonderful, the show. Wonderful man. Um, he gives her, he gives Betty his mother's ring. Um, and then he, when, when, right when she was going to give birth to Robin, he had to go sell the ring to pay for the birth. Whoa! Yeah, to pay for the birth. Yeah, there's that's no the most American. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> you're giving, you're giving, you're doing essential human mm, thing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you uh, got a baby, didn't you? <laughs> Fifteen months later. <laughs> <laughs> what are you complaining about? Yeah, we gave it to you, didn't we? <laughs> we didn't take we it. Kept it. I mean, here. we didn't keep it underground <laughs> where they pushed the wheel. <laughs> Wish they could. <laughs> Wish they could. <laughs> um, Fifteen months later, they have their own. They have a kid together, Camille. Um. They would then have a, a couple other daughters down the road. Um, so this is the 60s now, right? So this is like 64, mm. 65. Wait, so is all, all, of her kid, all of his kids are, are women? He has three daughters with Betty. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. And he's like, wow, can you imagine? Dude, dude. dude. I can't. Dad, what you that, wait, there is that is Aaron. That is, and they're mixed race too. And in the in in Pimpy talks about mixed yeah, race girls, huh? yeah, being high commodity. Wow, Dad, what you do in your twenties? I'm Aye. not going to tell you about that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, it's, it's, I was a priest. It, it's um, huh? <laughs> it's it's. <laughs> He there. I'll, I'll I'll read it in the Patreon. But he he talks about you know being a pimp, having three girls, you know, all girls. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's biological and, and children. He, he's, I mean it's just and, amazing. And he, he does. There's not a man in his life. I know. Yeah. And and again, I mean it's it's a wonderful poetic. It is because it is. He always was surrounded by women. Yeah. And now he is again, and uh, so. Uh, it's it's, it's sixty five, and you know he's living in in South Central, right, and. Um, the Watts riots happen, Ooh. and this is uh, gigantic, right? The Watts riots is like a full on yeah, oh, it's huge. And so he starts, you know, for the first time in his life, he has something to like fear for their safety, and um, he just gets really, really protective of them, and and, and really con- hyper conscious of being seen out with these young mixed race girls like taking on the laundromat or whatever and he sees pe- the way people stare at him and he's just like I can't I you gotta take I, I just can't do it because I, I one I fear for their safety so that if anybody looks at me sideways like I might kill somebody you yeah. know um, is he taking them where they live is it is it white? Is it black? It's a mixed race. South Central. They live. Yeah, it's it, it, it. White flight had already happened or was happening at this point. So, like he said, you know, they live on the outskirts. So where it's just kind of a mix of people. So he's getting shit at the black laundromat for mixed race. Well, kids I mean, there. just any public place, he's gonna just get looked at by everybody. Everybody. It's everybody. An older yeah, black I guess, yeah, man I guess that, uh, dressed yeah. like a pimp. Yeah. With yeah. little white black, you know, mixed race girls. Yeah. It's, it just it, he whether it's perceived or real for him it makes him uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a lot of people looking at the scene and going, "Oh, I know what happened there." Yeah, yeah, yes. And you know, for the longest time, he he didn't tell Betty 
what he did. And he would always say, I'll tell you later. But, you know, by the time they had kids, she already knew. But, you know, he exp- and he would, uh, you know, uh, detail the accounts of his brutality to her. And then she would be fascinated by it. And, and then eventually he was telling these stories to his whole family. And like, they're like, you know, for sometimes we didn't watch TV. We just watch our dad. Oh my God. Telling these crazy stories. It's not just like, oh, I raped the bitch or whatever. I mean, right, right, just right. the crazy it shit. It took weeks right. for the piss to come out yeah. of my hair, man. <laughs> and, and they would, you kids will never live like that. You never know how good your daddy had it. Now go wash up. <laughs> go wash your hair, you little piss stained freaks, rug rats, crumb crushers. <laughs> So he would like act it out and shit. And sometimes he'd have them play the roles. Mm. And like, it was just incredible. Don't judge me. Daddy, (laughs) you ain't nothing but a scurvy bitch. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That's exactly right. Now it's time for bed, honey. (laughs) (laughs) Into infinity. (laughs) So, um, you know, Betty would be like, this is fucking really good shit, man. You got to write this stuff down. Hmm. Yeah, he's like I write on the ceiling. <laughs> I write up. Yeah, <laughs> and I dance on the ceiling too. And she would, and, and she was like, "You could, you could make this could be a book. You know, you could write this down." And he was like, "Nah." And so she's encouraging him to do this. Mm. She's pimping him. And um, <laughs> Betty makes you. Betty makes hmm. you get out there and write a book. Oh, <laughs> so I'll slap you. He would, he would go. He be, he would get wrapped up. Like not, I want to say a trance, but he would reenact these things he'd write on the ceiling for her and, but out loud and she'd write it down. Oh, okay. Cause there is a verbal quality to it, his writing. Yes. yes. And, and, and I'll tell you later, he would be considered a better orator than even, even as a good of a writer. He was people that saw him speak in person. Yeah. Said he was yeah. The jazz, like I was saying, like, do you hear it? You go it's like, so good. It's- and so he, he was like, all right, yeah, well, let's do this. And he want he wanted to distinguish himself from uh, other black writers that were prominent at that time, like James Baldwin. Who, I was just going to say Baldwin. And he felt is definitely an influence on him. Definitely, but he felt in the speaking, particularly on so, television. Yes, yeah. when you hear Baldwin, in the, in the you hear some you iceberg. Hear the, yes, Baldwin but, has there's the, he has this like this rhythm. There's yes, this, there's a but, rhythm to but it. But right? there's also a thing too of that both of them come from the perspective of in their writing. And I'm sorry to cut you off real quick, but I just think they share this thing, which is like everybody has always told me I'm nothing. Yes. And I like fought my way up. That's what Baldwin left and, and just country. W- just was like, I am something, and this is an undeniable fact. And I am always like just replenished and renewed by knowing that this is true. Yes, uh, and 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 Baldwin certainly paved the way, yeah. right? Because of wh- exactly what Iceberg criticized him for, which was he felt that James Baldwin wrote. For educated white audiences. Yeah. I would say Iceberg in a way does too. He specifically wanted to distinguish himself from that. And he said he wanted to write for disadvantaged whites and blacks and at a fifth grade level. Wow. Specifically. And it was just, there was, there had never been a voice like that, you know? Um, Well, because usually they don't say write down. Usually they say write write up. up, Write up, yeah. Right. Um, that's why he was writing on the ceiling, uh-huh. <laughs> writing on his own. That's why I was writing on the ceiling. Um, and he also wanted to, um, kind of model it, model this book, whatever it was going to be, um, after his hero, Malcolm X, who also was a Detroit pimp. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and his autobiography had just come out about a year before. Wow. Um, and he, this was also kind of therapeutic for him because he wanted to expose the, this, this, this world, this underworld of poisonous pimps exploiting their own community. Yeah. It's a, it's a, um, it's like you're doing it's a morally downward economy. Yeah. No one wins. And, and it's, it is it's going- doing, and it's doing the, uh, oppressive establishments work for them. Yes, it's showing everybody that we live in hell without the caveat that you gave us nowhere else to live. Yeah. And and, and who are most and nothing of the, else to do. Yeah. Who, who are most of the customers? The customers are the people white, that, are, white, are, that are keeping you, actively he, he, keeping he, you in he that position. And he directs his women to specifically only fuck 
white guys. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, he, they, they put together this, this manuscript, you know, he, um, he pitches it to this one, uh, this one professor publisher guy and he, he just gets this, he reads the contract and it's all like, oh, 50, 50 split, all that stuff. And then he goes, and then I read that there was like, there was one little caveat in the end that negated the rest of the contract. And I was like, fuck this. And so he kind of abandons the plan for a minute and he, they do a little more tinkering him, Betty on the, on the, the manuscript. And then he reads an ad in, in the Sentinel, which is LA's black newspaper. And it's uh, it's an ad by Holloway House, mm-hmm. and Holloway House was this uh, publisher that actually was a direct result of the reforms made after the Watts riots. Wow! And it was this little publishing house run by these Jewish guys, and the ad in the paper said, "Black writers needed. We are looking for black writers that have riveting stories about the black experience." And he submitted a short scene, um, little. 20 pager thing which was actually the the beginning of the book that i read to you yeah where you know being a pig for snorting cocaine and yeah uh, we're humping our asses off it's nasty whore asses you got enough battery there matt oh we're good okay and it's still to be sold to a white audience white and black sure no for sure i mean especially when you consider where where they eventually get sold but you know they submit a short scene and he um goes back to uh goes home and, and, and they're working on they're working he's working on the rest of the the manuscript of betty and he's like you know i gotta protect some of these names you know so that's he changes betty baby bell to sweet jones hmm. and um there's a few other names get, that why get, baby bell baby bell's dead he, the code no shit wow good for him and even his own and he uh you know he he He's like, well, I, 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 I'm even going to change my own name. And he rem- this conversation he has with Betty about, you know, you got to be, when you're doing the pimp thing, you got to be ice, you got to be cold. And she says, like, an iceberg. She says, that's it. And she's the one that comes up with the name Iceberg Get Slim. the fuck out, Betty May Shoe comes wow, up with Iceberg that's Slim. that's cool. Get out. Because he went as Lancaster Slim or Slim Lancaster and Kavanaugh Slim. But Iceberg is from, is Betty. from Betty. Wow. Um... And Betty was a good-looking lady. Um, burger the, broad. Burger, yeah. Burger baby. Yeah, she's a burger. Now, how did the burger baby come out? <laughs> what? Well done? Ground. <laughs> I mean, there's a picture of her in here. What were the topics? Well, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you guys a picture later. Now she looks all fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's in the documentary that Ice T produced. And, uh, oh, she got like different color eyes. She's smoking fucking Marlboro Red. Sounds mm, really rough. More like Freddie Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> she looks like Betty's shoe. <laughs> <laughs> That's so stupid. Uh, so he goes to their office after after they read it. They tell him to come into the offices, and uh, it's on Melrose. Nice. And they offer him a contract on the spot. They give him a fifteen hundred dollar advance. Hey, all right. He goes back and, and he finishes it. A hundred thousand word. You know, it's it's for a hundred thousand words. Now, what year is this? Nineteen. Uh, well, it's sixty six, and it gets published in sixty seven. Oh, okay. So fifteen hundred dollars. Oh, it's big. It's a big deal. It's yeah, big, big deals. And um, it's published in sixty seven. The first year, this first year, it doesn't sell well. Um, and that's it's partly because. Holloway House is basically a pulp publisher. Mm. It's paperbacks, shit like that. And they vampire down the street, ba- basically. And they their books were sold in newsstands, local bookstores, liquor stores, barber shops. Yeah. You know, it's. I wish liquor stores still sold books because that would be. No, oh, you wouldn't have to oh, go anywhere. Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> One stop shop. No, but really, just his cash check. Just the just the, just the choice of books <laughs> yes, they'd have. Would be amazing. They'd be like, oh, you're a fucking degenerate. You, you can find <laughs> every. You know what? You can find. There's a few in the city you can find. Oh, really? That will you you can see some paperbacks. Get out. Yeah. Yeah. You, but uh, literally, if you. Yeah, I'm not talking about adult DVDs. It's not an adult bookstore, dude. Uh, I'm not talking uh, about two longs make a white. Aww. John, you can take the book out of the liquor store, but you can't take the liquor store out of the book. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't get it. <laughs> So uh, they tried to promote the book by a few different means, right? So um, 
they tried taking out sensationalist ads in the newspaper, right? Like, mm. uh, uh, pimp secret life, uh, br- the brutal reality of a sexual jungle. Oh, uh, uh, see? they, they sent him on speaking engagements at colleges, uh, booking him on talk shows like, uh, Louis e. Lomax, Dick Cavett show. Okay. Dick, get the fuck they out. Got he was on, on Dick Cavett. They got him on Dick Cavett. Oh, that's so good. But it was his Wish appearance Dick in 68. On the Joe Pine show. Joe Pine. Joe Pine. It, it, this is what got him in the public eye. He he was there to promote his second book, actually, Trick Baby, which is kind of an unofficial sequel. Trick Baby is a very interesting. It's is it a, like a, trick, a novel. It's called. Yeah, it's another. It's another semi autobiographical. Uh, but okay. it's it's not from his point of view. Uh, trick hmm. Baby, the story of a white Negro. Um, trick Baby is the story of a character named White Folks. And he is, yeah, character in white folks. And in the in the in the book, he meets back in prison. And so the the trick baby picks up where pimp left off, basically. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, and, uh huh. And he's called white folks because he's passing. And it, wow. it's about him, kind of escaping the oppression of being a black man by and, having passing by, complexion by passing. Yeah, yeah. And then it gets, dude, it gets up in it and the climax of the book is fucking I, he is it based like, on a real person or no it is based on a real person but the story so he really does now he, he's just a straight up author like he's yes, doing yeah, he's, yes yeah. Uh, so he's there to promote that book um he, he's a black hustler right white folks is a black hustler who passes and he uh the, the climax of the book it's crazy he's at this like white high society dinner and he's like pretty much forced to take part in this debate between a racist white co- Southern cop and a liberal white capitalist. <laughs> and they, dude, <laughs> that sucks. Let me read you, fucking, dude. I mean, he's not really taking part in the debate. He's kind of just like watching it happen. Mm-hmm. Folks, we got a debate here tonight <laughs> between a and, uh, racist. <laughs> and you know, there were a lot of capitalist. there were a lot of white passing novels at the time, but nothing like this. And uh, That's so interesting. <clears throat> What'd you do? Dude, I'm having trouble with my stiff swipe. You really don't understand the mechanics. Nope. I mean, it's long, but it's not thick. So he's, um, dude, I hate this. Here, uh, twist that, <laughs> twist that knob, twist that knob there, and then that'll loosen, twist it so it loosens that, the, the, that middle shaft, and, and then it. tighten it. Tighten the middle shaft. Nope. Yeah. Oh, yeah, tighten, tighten that. Isn't that nice? See how I'm working the hot black shaft. Watch me work the shaft. This is not working the way. No, you gotta go the other way. Yeah. Righty tighty, bro. Yeah, but you're not going right. You're... I'm going right this way. It's that way. Can we edit this out? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, in the middle. Yeah, in the middle of the. the this is the thing that. Yeah, I'll, let, yeah, the, I'll, I'll cut it every. The, says the can pimp we edit episode this where you don't know how to work the black shaft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, I, we'll, we'll I'm the one that who out. pimps. Not. I am the one who pimps. <laughs> you can take the black shaft out of air. So. Now this is from Trick Baby. This is from Trick Baby, uh, the novel that he's there to promote on the Joe Pine Show, right? Because he had a multi-book contract with with Holloway House. Do I need a snap? No. Because <laughs> I'm about to. <laughs> I'm about to break. <laughs> um, he's forced to, forced to witness and participate in this debate. This debate, this debate between, I guess, a white racist police chief and a liberal. White capitalists, as they say. Yes, very uh, cool. The oh, most liberal. Oh, oh. Still the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sure, but very the two different. Is how cla- they castrate Different you. class of people here and different two sides of, yeah, yeah, of sure. society. And it, the debate is over the so called Nigra problem. I mean, that framing right there is uh, an issue. <laughs> it's problematic. <laughs> Each man lays out his Orwellian solution. Fantastic. Uh, the police, uh, uh, the, his Orwellian solution to the to the uh, political black struggles at the time. Mm. The police chief, his solution is to batter black protesters and civil rights advocates using force doled out by racist white pol- racist white policemen. That's what he knows. And he says, "I've known uh, since my rookie policeman days that they uh, blacks." Uh, steal, rape, whore, pimp, and murder because they are basically criminally inclined. They are derived from inferior loins. They still think that. The capitalist ideas are worse. He reveals a, quote, master plan to separate educated African-American leaders from the black masses in order to neutralize them. They still believe that. There are really two ghettos, he says. One is physical. The other is psychological. Mm. Now, it is true that we have selected certain 
to wear white collars. Almost all of them do make physical escapes from the ghetto, with our assistance, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Bank of America. Our motives are first to give dramatic, well-publicized reinforcement to our liberal image. Secondly, those whom we seem to liberate are precisely those type of who possess rare intellect and academic polish. We have to remove them from the seething black masses. They still think that. This book is fucking wild. Yeah. I'm listening to it now. It's no, I would say that's still basically when I said the same thing. Uh, I think that it's, the attitudes are, are almost that where there is a, a very uh, stupid uh, racist class and then there is a very classist class. Yeah, there's a classist racism. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, as yes. far, is, is racism it? is a lazy mm. form of classism. Uh, it's it's very low level, shallow uh, he, classism. Yes, and the more educated liberal would have the sense to, of course, realize that uh, there are people that can uh, uh, adapt. You can exploit anybody of any color. Yes, mm, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And in, uh, in, in, in this and, one, and both are nefarious, right? And this is kind of about that. I mean, granted, this is from the seventies or whatever, but, but it it's is really right on. It's yeah. dead on. And the whole book is about all the different cons a trick baby does as a hustler, and then as he cons his way up the ranks of of white society, he realizes what the real con is: white racism. Because it, it, it goes just oh, they they're conning us into conning each other. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, From both sides. Uh, no. Uh, completely. 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 And I, I've said it on the show before, but the cruelest thing, uh, from my white privileged perspective, is uh, the turning of black people on each other about how to deal with us. Well, it's like you know. Uh, That's the meanest. Yeah, divide and conquer. I mean, yeah. the, it, and it happens. You know, it, it happens in every place it can. Yes, of course. Every. Um, and so one can empathize with uh, the black struggle yeah, they, 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 oh, to black, a degree. Black on black crime, where you're like, be, but white people, white are still yeah yeah. Do, yeah. Wait, were you gonna dismiss what the white people are doing uh, yeah. because of quote black on black crime? Yeah, yeah it, you know, it, and it's, it's just it's just crime, it, and, and, and it's all. And it's to, it's to take away focus on the real crimes being perpetrated upon all of us. Yes. Um, I th I think you know listening to you know what they're saying I, the only thing that has changed now I think is that poor white people uh are probably lumped in a little bit as well or maybe they always lumped were lumped in in what way would you in mean? the in the way that the they're part of the 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 unwanted group as well cops cops I feel like uh yeah, no yes they I mean you saw that 4 years ago right uh the 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 white the Retaliation of the uneducated poor white person in, at the ballot box. Yeah, but but uh, yeah, but, but I think uh, you know th there's this uh, teaching among cops. The guy, like you know, there's this guy that goes around the country teaching cops at uh, how to how to deal with people, and he 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 says you know they are there's three groups. There's wolves. You're the wolf, or no, the wolf is the criminal. Mm -hmm. There's the sheep and the sheep herder, and you're the sheep herder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everybody the cop is supposed to protect is the sheep. Yep. Doesn't matter who they are. Right. And then the wolf is anybody you think is bad. You have to fucking kill the wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And usually the wolf means someone who's not white. Right. But there's right. all sorts of. Wolf. But for the capitalist, sometimes the uh, poor white is is also a, a, a part of the mark too. Yeah, and that in that book illustrates the as he as he's cons his way up to the top he sees the most nefarious con of all and it's not even the white police chief yeah it's the so-called liberal white cow. absolutely yeah, it's absolutely. really it's i mean it's it's the gavin newsom yeah I mean, he's got a nice hair though uh, yeah he was only married to an insane was woman perfect. yeah well she went out insane after she left that beautiful head of hair dude <laughs> <laughs> when Wake up, sheep. <laughs> so, You're being a wolf right So now. he's on the show to promote this book, his second book. Joe Pine. Yeah. He's on the Joe, Joe Pine. Pine. I've never heard and of Joe Pine. Neither. Have you ever heard of Joe Pine? No. Mm -mm. So. <laughs> Dick Cabot, Joe Pine. He, um. <laughs> Betty makes this mask for him to go on the show. And it is fucking weird looking, dude. But what, what do you what, what do you mean? It like it's kind of like protect, you know, the other physical mask, a physical mask. Yeah, okay, and it's you know maybe maybe protect his identity, kind of adding to the allure of a kind of a tell all situation. Oh, that's cool. 
and it's black fabric and it's sewn over dark goggles and it looks like um a gas mask doing minstrel blackface it's really weird mm. looking and it was this is like the puffy shirt from the Sun. next morning people mob pickwick books in hollywood and they sold out wait so it worked it was the mask you think i think so Jesus. uh every copy of the book was sold out phone calls flooded holloway house office um probably just del- deliberately lo- looking like, like a villain yeah, he got his own yeah, Doctor yeah, Doom yeah. mask. It's, it's, yeah, it, yeah. I, that's what I, I when I first saw. I was like, "Oh, Mace Doctor," but it's also this like, it's not necessarily villainy. It is also like, in a way, hide, I'm hiding my identity, and make, that makes it interesting. But it's also reappro- in a way or way reappropriating the minstrel blackface him because yeah, I'll show you the yeah, picture yeah. and also the dark side of human nature, right? The one that the one that wants to go and get a prostitute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's is part it, of so, it, too. It, it. I think it was such a master stroke by Betty. Yeah, be, on really so many levels. Betty's running the operation. Betty's the pimp. What? No, but she's nice. No, she is. She and, uh, yeah. and he he was he was her burger. <laughs> <laughs> And that doesn't have anything to do with Dr. Cheeseburger that got him back with his mom. Yeah, Dr. Doomburger. Dr. Pleb Burger. What was his name? Pleb? Pleb? Dr. Uh, Chunk Beagle. Yeah. Now that guy was good. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe we did both these episodes in one night. <laughs> <laughs> in a few years' time, Pimp would sell millions of copies, making him the most popular black author in the country. Wow. And that's Baldwin still alive. This is this is 66, 65? 60, 60, 68. Oh, okay. Well, okay, you know, 68. Kennedy. So then when is when is uh when is X killed? Uh 65. Yeah, 60, maybe. yeah X is dead, uh, I think 67. So yeah, but uh, MLK and Bobby Kennedy is 68. Yeah. And, and I think Malcolm X There's one more. There's one more in 68, isn't there? Um yeah, everybody died that year. Well, the Spruce Goose, goose crashes, and that's really devastating. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> R.I.P. Uh, I read you that bit from Trick Baby. Uh, it, it like Pimp, uh, also kind of ends on this, you know, uh, bitter, sour note, bittersweet, mm. bittersweet. Uh, no, and and it ends with there are only two kinds of people in this world: grifters and suckers. Damn. And uh, so anyways, his fame grows in the late 60s and he cultivates this persona in L.A. Um, and he and he kind of started to see himself as a spokesperson for black urban America. Um, and, he, and he really, I mean, he's just a totally different person than. Than in the when he was pimping in the 30s, I mean, he joined he joined the L.A. chapter of Operation Breadbasket, which was started by MLK and they, it had just started its L.A. branch when he was killed mm. around this time. Uh, he gave, uh, gave lectures every Saturday, uh, joined the open door program, which was an outgrowth of the Watts writers workshop, which was a response to the Watts, right? He got involved in the performing arts society of Los Angeles. I mean, like he would memorize, uh, I'm sorry, mesmerize audiences with his lectures. Um, for on like a million different topics, uh, history of the Puritans, Theories of sexual repression and violence in contemporary society, uh, and the economics of the sex trade. Like these, I'm gonna get some of these lectures on the. Uh, yeah, I'll have one. Um, thank you. And and um, was it uh, was it Chester? It was uh, another um, uh, uh, black author would say after seeing him. Thank you. Uh, speak. He said that, uh, unbelievably, uh, he was a better speaker than he was writer. Yeah. Um, cause he was just so animated and like you said, it was this jazz thing about it. Yeah. There's a, there's something to it. Also, that's how this podcast started. It was my friend telling me I was bad at writing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he was, he was, you're more of a talker. Yeah. Writer, yeah. talker. You know, pond is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> he said pod is good for you. Pod is, pod is good for you. That's funny. He, um, that's very good. He would, uh, <laughs> very good. <laughs> it only took, it only took an hour and a half, but I got one. No, school or pod, pod <laughs> is good for you. Um, at the end of his lectures, he would often get like mobbed. Yeah. Um, 
he um you know he he started writing more and more um after after trick baby um and he said that uh i mean he was just really intense right and he he said that writing is better than pimping (laughs) in fact it's better than being a doctor or a lawyer i don't have to go to court i don't have to go to the hospital to perform an operation i have no equipment man look i don't even need paper i'll write on the walls all of my equipment is in my noggin and another thing, writing has been a wonderful boon for me, psychologically. The vacuum of ego that existed when I could no longer pimp has been filled most adequately. It's pimp and work. And he was, when he was writing a book, he was writing 16 hours a day, missed meals, ignored his kids, <laughs> um, <laughs> would go several days without bathing. Um, and he would always, I mean, he was always hassling Betty, like, I need you to help me. Like, he just really, really depended on Betty um, and, and, and loved her. Um, but sometimes I get a bit, a bit much. Uh, well, we get a bit much. His intensity and focus and drive. Mm. Um, so, so that kind of like pimp energy would pimp go, energy, big, would, yeah, would, pimp would, energy would go towards writing, and yeah. sometimes that meant he would uh, be kind of short. Yeah, and, and just you know, not, just forget that his kids were in the fucking room. You yeah. know, um, he. Uh, Um, they moved, uh, they, they were coming up a little bit, you know, because he's, he's got a contract to write these books. Sure. Uh, they moved to a, uh, two bedroom house and, Ew, uh, right. he bought a 48 Lincoln Continental. Always, which, a, always a 48. It's, it's always like a, f- I mean, it was like, it, it's reminiscent of his time. Yeah, I, like, yeah, you know, yeah. There were a few other ones that were 47 uh, back then, but the 48 Lincoln Continental was like a boat with a V12 engine. Like, oh, a 48 Lincoln. No shit. Okay. It's a V12. Yeah. It's a oh. beast. I drink V8. I don't know what that's like. Um, he wrote uh, his third novel, Mama Black Widow, which was uh, also revolutionary. It, um, it focused on a, um, Otto Wilson and, and this black queen hustler. Like, this is the first time I really had a, focused on like a homosexual. No cool. way. Wow. Yeah. yeah it's, Whoa. Um, that's fucking cool, man. Yeah. Um, and he also... in. I think it was during this book that he kind of started reconciling this we- the weird sexual homosexual dynamic of of prostitute and pimp, like the withholding of sex, the being prettier than your whores thing, and um, and then the, that was a homosexual dynamic. Yeah, so he says like I gotta find it here. Um, you know, although, although he did not identify as gay himself, he acknowledged that there was a certain fluid sexuality in the pimping profession that had prepared him for the writing of Mama Black Widow. I've always suspected, even in my own case, that one of the elements of attraction is that a woman in the life, pimping or whoring, can somehow have her lesbian tendencies gratified, her latent homosexuality gratified by the pimp's latent homosexuality. By the dandy daddy. Mm-hmm. Is that my name? <laughs> you are the dandy daddy. <laughs> That's uh, the new Yeah, the next time, yeah, yeah, you're the dandy daddy. <laughs> her latent homosexuality gratified by the pimp's latent homosexuality by the female quotient in his personality. Mm. Yeah, and, and yeah, the fanciness of, of dress. You're right. Yeah, uh, being. I mean, being, he, he would put. You know, he would go put on makeup. Yeah. Fabulous. Remember in that in the first uh, oh, remember man. that yeah, yeah. you're getting that your is... hair done you're getting your nails done you've got your yes you go to the salon a lot that's where his mom met Steve yeah. he was getting his nails done when he picked her up yeah oh, wow. so this I mean just this, this incredible insight yeah. You know, that allowed him to... And also saying... And it, also, it's very progressive. He's, he's a black man writing it's, about... It's, it's saying it then. Yeah. Because the other side of that is you have fucking Gore Vidal doing, you know, his his fucking, like... Well, he, not acknowledging... Tra- transgender uh, shit, like, you know, like, in, in novel form at the time. And there was that... That was... That was edgy as fuck from a, a educated... Educated white man. Yeah. High, and high society. Well, yeah, like, I guess high. That, now that I think about it, like, Ginsburg, Ginsburg too, right? Yeah, but that was beat, and that, that was, was almost beat. black. You're right, you're right. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And uh, they they had more in common than he had with Vidal. Mm, yeah. Ginsburg and, and Iceberg, mm-hmm. well, they shared yeah. the, the Bergs. They're both Jews. <laughs> yeah, both chosen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Iceberg? Ginsburg? Whoa. Um, that's really, I like that. Uh, so You gotta be on gin, baby. <laughs> you gotta be ginned up to do... To support Nambla, <laughs> which is what I do. So I'm thinking I'll call myself Ginsburg Al. 
What? <laughs> I'm really glad we did this all in one night. Man, I really hate you. Yeah. Um, he did support Nampa. So just... yeah, well, you know, it was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a different it was, Nampa. Hey, it was quite a different time. By 1971, he had sold over two million books. People knew him on the street. They'd stop him on the street. I nice. follow him around. He used um, to do that. He wrote the name of the Naked Soul of Iceberg Slim. Ooh. Um, a collection of essays and vignettes and um, personal deliberations. Mm. Um, I think he modeled it after the soul of the black man. Um, he wrote of America as a kind of prison in, in that book. Um, I'm just pulling up a couple things here. Uh, you know, he starts becoming more political, uh, more overtly, 68, 69? Revolution, 71. 71, yeah. fair enough. But in, and, you know, because of the time, 68, 69. Oh, right? God, dude. I mean, you can't even count everything that's going on then. Um, I mean, 68 was such an insane time. And he... It was through 69. And then you know, it the, Some it. of these essays are um, yeah. called Rapping About the Pimp Game, Racism and the Black Revolution, which is... Dude, this one's actually really good. It's a... Uh, about the over overvaluation of white female sexuality, dude. This one is not so over good. over evaluation, overvaluation, overvaluation. Okay. So, um, as he as he writes in um, the Naked Soul of Iceberg Slim, which is modeled after W. E. B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk. That's the what uh, it was modeled after, and James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. Um, he characterizes America as a kind of prison. And, uh, <laughs> dude, it's fucking nuts. Um, over the course of 15 chapters, he weighs in on a range of topics, including the history of lynching, the potential for black revolution, uh, the social and psychological causes of pimping, the class divide in America, Western standards of beauty and racism in the prison system. Um, a lot of stream of consciousness stuff in there. He didn't... You know, he just kind of was doing a lot of exploration of his own writing style. Mm. Yeah. Um, in in the Naked Soul of Iceberg Slim, um, in his essay "Racism in the Black Revolution," he hypothesizes that pimping is the result of the overvaluation of white female sexuality. What he calls the quote "mythic white super cunt." <laughs> John, you'd be called that. <laughs> yeah. Not only was the sanctity of white womanhood used as a convenient excuse to lynch black men beginning in the late 19th century. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Tell that Emmett Till. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you don't have to. Uh, the white woman as the exclusive measure of beauty has carried over into the 20th century in television, movies, magazines, and other forms of consumer culture. As a consequent, he, consequence, Beck theorizes, the black woman is more susceptible to the false charms of the pimp. Especially during his, his time. Sure, yeah. Not yeah. so much now or when he wrote it, but at that time. Because she is an overshadowed underdog, essentially deprived of the chance to win herself a dependable, desirable man, and thereby security and a sense of self-esteem. She is an easy mark for the gaudy black pimp and his, his hypnotic castles in the sky. Wow. Ironically, this dynamic promoted by white racist thought also motivates the very same race to seek out the black prostitute. So this is the stuff that he's kind of repurposing from Baby Bell. Yeah. It's the mythic, the other. The embodiment of taboo. Yeah. 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 Taboo. Just. He witnessed many white men secretly leaving their ideal suburban lives to troll the streets in the black ghetto in search of the very thing they supposedly despised most. He says, the sadistic guilt overwhelms his hatred for the black race. The racist submits his quivering body to beatings and, and feces of the black woman. Eagerly, joyously, he roots his ecstatic nose into a black cunt to stain himself, punish himself. Mm -hmm. With balls near bursting, he will leave pleasant <laughs> nests and the alabaster super cunt in suburbia to comb the booby-trapped ghetto for a black female object, his instrument of torture. Yeah. Yeah. How do you say such nasty shit? It sounds so good. It is nasty. And I know, like, I it keep is. reading, I know I'm, like, quoting obsessively from the books, but, like, it's just no, 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 it's such it, a unique it is, style it that is, I yeah. can't help but... And I would say, furthermore, that that, that, that attitude and that, uh, 
thing of, of, of the fetishization still very much leads its way to white racism today. Mm-hmm. Where the people will say like, oh, they get too much. And it's like, you you think they get too much because You're, you we, fetishize them. And we had and, this, and this you, conversation the other night. Yes. And, and, and you feel like... you And you're jealous that you don't have the excuse. You're jealous that you don't have a cause. And you're also jealous you don't have that... A or an identity. You don't have an identity because you don't have a cause. You have a boring fucking white suburban lifestyle. And whiteness is not an identity, right? No. Right. Irish, you know, they, have, they say, oh, well, why isn't there like a white pride? Well, dude, well, there's fucking... There's uh, life. Same, there's, there's German there's white there's, there's, life. Yeah, there's yeah. San Gennaro's Festival. There's a yeah. million white festivals, but you just don't know which one the fourth, you are. Fourth of July is white pride. Sure. Uh, right. But it is that thing, too, where... Whiteness is not an identity. There, there's, yes. people, there's people thinking that... Uh oh man, if I had it black, I'd be so easy because I would have such a snug little identity. Oh, yeah. And you go like, no, 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 no. You'd be worried about your son getting shot in the street every day by the police because it's a very real threat. And then when they complain about it by politely kneeling at a football game, you completely lose your fucking. So mind. what else yeah. do you let them do? And right. yeah, yeah. And and it's just like this whole thing about control and envy and insanity and the whole time. And, and it is the black person is the exact same person as you, mm-hmm. just wishing to be dealt with a little bit of dignity. Yeah. yeah. And that's all it is. And to your point about the modern fetishization, the number one fucking porn searches in the South are all fucking black cuckold yeah. shit. Mm-hmm. Always. Yeah. By white people. Fetish. You're sick. Me? Exclusively amateur. And here's the thing. If- <laughs> <laughs> what? Shut up. Wait, what? Nothing. <laughs> If, if, yeah, I am glad, I'm glad in the middle of this great discussion about race, you're like, and kind of shit, I, <laughs> I know what I'm into. Um, so, but, but I, I also want to say that uh, if you, if they, who's they, the the people searching for those things, uh huh, you, if you. they were, <laughs> <laughs> if I, if I was taught that it's not a big deal, that would. That would change the once the stigma can be changed. That it, it's not a stigma in that but way anymore. But it still anymore. is hot. Yeah, it's always going to be hot because sex is hot. It is. There's no cold sex. I don't like it. I mean, even even in Antarctica, I frown they upon say, it. Even in Antarctica, they say there's no cold sex there, John. You're joking me. Wow. I don't, you know, I'm not the expert here. You can so, just tell from the drunken <laughs> statements I'm making now. You guys are not experts. <laughs> Sex experts. Thank yeah, you. Perverts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Perverts. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. you. So, um, I, I, I really loved that little breakdown. In, in, yeah, we nailed it. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. Thank you. So, <laughs> then, you know, it's t- uh, the table the thing, tide changes a little bit here. Um, he starts noticing that his royalty checks are light and Uh-oh, vague. Oh, getting skimmed. And <laughs> he's like, how the fuck is this? I'm doing all the work and I'm not getting any of the money. No, Aaron. I what? do not like where this is going. He's getting, Aaron, this is freaking me out. Tell me what happened. This is freaking you out. <laughs> he's getting like $800 checks like once every couple months as a millionaire or a million and, million books and, selling and author. At the, because at the same time like holloway house is saying oh m- millions of books being sold and he's like i can't feed my kids right now he's getting fucked and he's not getting, he's getting screwed out of royal he's yeah. doing all the work yeah and not getting any money yeah he's getting pimped mm-hmm. and, and the holloways were an irish family is that no, right no, 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 Jews. <laughs> oh did he do that so are, huh? you, are you anti-semitic john well no, 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 no he's, no, he's no, anti-irish no, well you know good luck in this town <laughs> Um, <laughs> I didn't say anything. Buy it. So he honestly, he goes back to hustling a little bit. He starts selling like he gets empty TV boxes and puts bricks in them and starts selling empty TV boxes to people. What? Yeah, he's, here's your box of he's TV. He's got mouths to feed. He's got mouths to feed. Oh, Jesus. He then so then he finds out he's getting like really fucked by Holloway House. Like no, like the 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 the, the pay subs they send him are a fucking joke. So this is a house that is established to <laughs> to like. "Quote unquote, bring uh, uh, a bring publishing up, company. Bring up black writers after the Watts riots, but really, at the end of the day, it's like the well, these, they they were members of this workshop that was funded by some of the uh, you know the reforms, that were and they're ripping them. off the people that they were going to promote, basically. Yeah, yeah. God, fuck, it's just, so 
It's a fucking. Well, you were, know what the good thing is? That never happened in the record industry. <laughs> you gotta say yeah. that. Yeah. And at least that never happened there. Yeah. It, at least it was exclusively in book writing. That's right. Jews and blacks working <laughs> yeah. together. Actually, <laughs> music was always above this. Um, he. Uh, Every industry. You know the the typewriter that the the vintage typewriter that Betty bought at like the Salvation Army broke down, and they had harassed the fucking company to give them another one. Um. So Jesus. he. It got so bad that he was really, I mean, like I said, he had to hustle again. Yeah. And so he wrote. No. He wrote them. And it is. Holloway. He wrote Holloway and he fucking excoriated them. And. um, He, he, in like, kind of realized he's, you know, he finds himself the victim of the same exploitation that he had perpetrated on countless women over the years. Right. It's poignant. Poignant? Yeah, like with the three daughters. What? Poignant. So, Holloway House never really uh, <laughs> came correct on that. Ever. But. but oh, you did a fly by night publishing <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, fly by. You know, they just basically they they ignored him, right? Uh, and he was still struggling. But Universal Studios mm. bought the rights to Trick Baby. For twenty five grand, damn! And they made a movie. They made they actually, they did make. They a movie. made a movie. It was right after uh, uh, Martin Van Peebles made Sweet Sweet Back's Badass oh, Song. No way! The wow. first true black exploitation movie, yeah. which was inspired by the success yeah. of Pimp Years Earlier. Of course, of course. Uh, also, in Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song is uh, Mario Van Peebles as a young boy who mm-hmm. plays a young Sweet Sweet Back. Um, has sex with a grown woman in it. Uh, as you do, and so that you know, you Just can see, you can then. see yeah. that oh shit, this genre is going to take off. So they, by the way, it's Trick Baby. Uh, it's made as a movie, um, and it's for the first time, you know, now they got some money. He bought he bought Betty like a mink coat. Ooh, uh, oh my God. and they go on um, their first family vacation. They get an RV. And then drive up and down the state. You know, they'll go to like San Diego and they go to Oh Disney my God, show. dude. I, I fucking, dude, that is the American dream to me. So, so check it out. He I packs, love it. He packs it, so packs it with all his outfits and shoes. <laughs> he never leaves the RV. What? He stays in it everywhere they go. You got to get inside, dude. He stays in the RV. <laughs> I mean, what this is mean, him staying in his pimp's apartment. Yeah. yeah. It, but he it's never movable. Fought, he's got an entire wardrobe with him. What if I could pimp everywhere? Hey, how about this? I have crocodile shoes and there's crocodiles outside. I don't think I'm going out there. What are they going to do? Eat what my shoes? Do? What about yeah, I'm gators. The gators are going to fuck my shoes. <laughs> he went and eat the crocodile. They're going to goose my so, shoes. Then he starts, you know, this is kind of stressful. You know, they're making more money what the fuck? For, on, on Betty. Oh, oh okay. your fucking father's just staying in the fucking RV. I'm taking he, you guys around to the bathroom at Disneyland. All <laughs> why is he, why is <laughs> your father's in the fucking RV. Yeah, yeah, what what is she from fucking Worcester? <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what are you gonna drag me around? <laughs> <laughs> you drag me around. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep sucking you, Derek. <laughs> <Can't be not. laughs> so, um, he grows apart from Betty. He starts hanging out at jazz clubs again. Some people say he started pimping again, but that there's no justification for that. And even his daughter's like, no fucking way. He he was over that. He yeah yeah no he's, he still he, loved my mom. He yeah. just was weird. Like this he just not, yeah. he just became like he just liked being alone. He got a little he got a little midlifey. Yeah, and he, I mean he's at this point he's you know even older than that. But yeah, he got that. Curmudgeon. Oh yeah, in black man years, he's, he's yeah, 167. Yeah, he's, he's getting yeah. curmudgeon a little bit, but mm. he still liked going to hang out with his people, right? So he goes in, he's hanging out at these jazz clubs. He's, he's He starts meeting um, more kind of famous in the scene people. He And he still has the urge to create and have his voice heard. And, you know, he he has that book of essays and then, you know, he also has this, his, you know, a history with the, the pimp toasts. And so he meets and befriends, uh, jazz legend. Um, uh, uh, red, uh, Holloway, mm-hmm. not of the Holloway house, but just <laughs> red Holloway. Mm-hmm. Hopefully not. And they record, hey, a book? he records an album. 
He re- called Reflections. Is it, is it, is it like uh, he's talking? Over music. Yeah. He's rapping yeah. over music. Well, it's like Whitey on the Moon. No, it's uh, tracks like The Fall, in parentheses, The Game, uh, Broadway Sam, Mama Debt, part one and part two. And this is in 76, a full year or two before Rapper's Delight. Or The Message Ooh. by Grandmaster Flash and oh, Sugar Hill Gang and Grandmaster Flash, respectively. Um, so I'm going to play for you a part one of Mama Debt. And this is in 76. And... <laughs> Big true word. Since I was just a boy, I punished hoes with sick joy. For pimping, I've been to the joint. And that ain't ha-ha. Up that way, I heard a shrink say, Son, it appears to me you hate your mama. (laughs) Doc, I pleaded, I want to be fair. Make it up somewhere. From the start, he sighed. You've mugged her heart. You've lived like Satan's pit. I bet nobody can pay a mom debt. Whoa. I'll yell back to the cell where I was winding up an ace. My cell had space like a casket. Shortly, a hack showed with his basket. He brought a letter from Ray in L.A. This is the news bro Ray had to tell. All of us here wish you well. We are crying because Ma's dying. She's moaning your name, praying you ain't no lame. Pain wishing you get here. Before she passes, Pally, don't dally there with them foul ho asses. <laughs> don't arrive late. Don't jive with Ma's fate. I felt like a triple double crosser. I could have killed that grinning heck Rosser. To LA that week, I got a one way ticket. Poor Ma's hair was a snow white thicket. Before Ma opened her eyes, I thought my ticker would cease. Ma was playing possum to shoot me through hot grease. I heard a titter. Ma's voice was bitter. You got here. Ain't you mama's precious dear? I got good news, ma. I said. I threw away my long shoes. <laughs> ma, I ain't shucking. I'm tired of joints. And police ducking. I quit the pimp game. Ain't got a hoe, I claim. I'll play the square way to keep old Wolf at bay. Ma rolled up her eyes and whispered, Sweet man, hush them lies. You're gonna get a pimp mobile with a nighttime glow, some rainbow suits, and some low life hope. <laughs> You're gonna get your nose froze with crystal blow. Ooh, hey. I said as I stroked Ma's red hot brow, I swear I'm staying now. Ma, I mean it to the bone. Please don't leave me alone. But kicker, she said, I ain't no hoe. 
Don't sugar bath me. Empty mug. I put my face on Ma's bosom and pled. Please, Ma, your doctor said in me believe or be dead. I smelled death on her breath when she spoke. She sighed. Only Jesus loves this old ugly joke. And Ma said with a bitter smile, you're too late. Sweet Jesus told me it's heaven I rate. He and the father is trying my case. Stood right there, smiling glory in my face. I said, Ma, JC ain't for real. I am. <laughs> He's just a ghost, plain scam. Everywhere. He's gonna Jim Crow you up there. Ma, remember Jim down Crow, here? JC? JC was unfair. Remember how you slave for the white folks? So that's it's going into part two of Mama Dad. There's a two it's a two part of it. You can see it's mm -hmm. like proto rap. <clears throat> Yep. Right, you know, mm -hmm. whereas Rapper's Delight and the message they speed that up. They sped it. They 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 sampled disco tracks. Uh, yeah, right. And this was doing jazz, which is coming back around. Like mm -hmm. you know, Kendrick Lamar has a lot of jazz shit on some of for sure. Yeah. Stuff. So Ooh. you see, it's this fucking also, this it's sixty very year old man. Blues too. Yeah. Yeah. Very blues. yeah it, it's jazzier yeah. in the beginning, but definitely blues toward the end as it slows down, and it is it's blues theme. What's, the, Ken, what's the Kendrick song that it was just like he's just talking about? Someone just getting shot. I just uh, yeah. Uh, it's on damn. Yeah. I just I, I, I yeah. It's but anyway, uh, it's just this little jazz thing going in the background. It's 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 pretty haunting. Yeah. Uh, but you you see where where it eventually leads to. Um, he leaves Betty. Um, he leaves her. They they break up. Okay. Uh, so, he he moves around L.A. with just a few possessions. Um. Bouncing around, you know, the greater L.A. Basin area. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Uh, he moves in uh, the home of a friend uh, who's a teacher just off Crenshaw. And, um, you know, he's still trying the writing thing. He tries to write a couple screenplays. He um, he publishes a few more books. Uh, uh, a, a woman named Diane Millman writes to him. Another white woman lives in Silver Lake. <gasps> As a fan, and he, he just write back to her, writes back and they kind of have this pen pal relationship and they eventually meet up and they hang out and they smoke weed and watch TV and cool. it's super platonic and then then he moves in with her and they get married um and she Diane still loves she she eventually is a, a big source for uh the book Street Poison and the documentary that I team made she was she had a lot of unpublished uh manuscripts of his documents that never saw the light of day until um, oh, okay. she was a big big help um you know, uh, um, and, uh, he would get a lot of letters from guys in, in jail. Cons? Guys? Yeah, guys. Uh, <laughs> They'd be love letters. No, he would just get letters. <laughs> from, They'd I mean, be like, you essentially love letters, but you know. You, you understand got, me, right? Yeah, and. and <laughs> Some sort of inspiration. You were a guy yeah, that he, was in lockup. Yeah, Here and you, you, you made something out of your. And this one guy, it, it's really powerful. And he's, you know, I'm, um, I, I'm in here, I, I sold crack. Because now crack's the huge epidemic, right? Yeah, you know, this, 80s, it, it, yeah. by the eighties, and and and, um, and he's like, "Listen," and, and the guy's telling Ice, he's telling Robert about how he's like, "I know you were a pimp during this time, and it was you did horrible things, but trust me, nothing is as bad as crack." Right. Well, imagine the, the capitalists instead, just instead of just the capitalist fucking people, the government is active. Oh yeah, they got into it. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. You think it's capitalism? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the CIA we're through. fucking all you. Yeah. Um. So and it. He just it describes his account of brutality uh, to to Robert in this letter, and then you know he just asks him like, "Do you have any? I see how how writing helped you, and do you have any tips? Any any tips? Any, any tips? And he writes back this really sweet response to the guy about how getting through prison and and how to get yourself right, and it's it's really sweet um, and thoughtful. Um, Mike Tyson would visit him. 
And I rem- as I was reading this book, I was like, holy shit, because I read the Mike Tyson uh, not, autobiography. Not in prison, right? No, no, no. He's, no. he's an old man now living in L.A. Yeah. At this point. Mike Tyson's he's, and Mike he's Tyson punching is, people. Mike Tyson is the height of his fame. He's the baddest man in the world. And he... He visits Iceberg because he read his book, right? And hey, Iceberg. Hey, Berg. Hey, Berg. <laughs> yeah, that's his hey, book. Hey, Rob. <laughs> and Rob. You know, uh, at this point, Mike Tyson <laughs> is getting fleeced by his management. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the people around him. Yeah. Well, fuck it. He's getting fleeced by Don King right now. And like, they Not had right a lot now, in common, that. right? They they were perceived to be. Uh, uh, you all, oh, boy, Matt, I, dumb, uh, <laughs> uneducated, criminal thugs. But in reality, they were both uh, thoughtful, thoughtful, philosophical, I mean, voracious mm-hmm. readers, yes. students of philosophy and psychology, well, yes. incredibly articulate, and 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 very uh, and uh, masters of their craft. Masters of the craft is the main thing. Yeah. Um, Tyson remembers their first meeting. He says, "And I sat down." <laughs> and no, wait, wait, him. wait, wait. Wait, can we just, before we go there, I I just, I have to piss. Can we just break break. real quick? And we're back. Hey. Hey. So Uh, now Mike Tyson's going ape shit. So let's... (laughs) So, yeah, he's with this Diane woman, right? Diane yes, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, the iceberg, iceberg is. The iceberg, right? Yes. Not and nice. just to some, you know, he's getting older now, right? This is the 80s. He's, what, 60s? He, he's maybe even a little bit older, right? He was born, I think, in 1918. So this is the 80s now. And God, yeah, he's, he's old, old as fuck. Yeah. His kidney's starting to go, starting to get diabetes okay. and stuff. He's, and he just kind of just stays in his apartment. Um, you know. Which um, is not. And he's got, true. his daughters are, are, they're in their 20s and, and stuff now. Right. Uh, they're really pretty girls. Um, mm. I'll save the story for the Patreon. Nice. Um, and so excited to Patreon for Fresno next to see five dollars a month extra show. Per I week. mean, honestly, you you well, you're the one who's getting the deal. You're the perfect. You're pimping us. You're yes. pimping us. I mean, yeah. we're doing all this for nothing. Uh, you get all that knowledge. Yeah. I get. I get. get I don't know what we would do uh, without okay. you. So much of beer. Yeah. Uh, and piss. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's the 80s. Uh, uh, it's rough. He doesn't have a lot of money. He's an old man. He's sick. It's steps, his son, Robin, who's, you know, not his son, but he right, doesn't right. really talk to him. The uh, first, that first. Robin doesn't really talk to him? Yeah. Is he grossed out by him? Uh, it's just not his dad. You know, it's. Uh, Everything's very complicated when your icebergs look, right? Yeah. yeah. I bet. Um, it is fucked up. He is very. Um, you know, he, when he came out of the womb, he was his dad. But so he wasn't his dad. That's tough, man. Yeah. So it's it's, it's eighty nice. now. It's eighty eight, and um, getting to Tyson. You know, Tyson. Tyson's out at a, a club in L.A. and he meets uh, an actor who was in a black exploitation movie. And uh, Iceberg comes up in conversation. He says he knows him, and Mike Tyson's like, "Holy shit! I've read all these books." Holy shit, I read up, you know. And so, um, I already the, the next day, he, he, introdu- <laughs> he introduces him to, to Beth. And they have a relationship. Like, anytime he's in town, he goes and sees him and stuff. And, you know, he, um, they, they found this common, you know, uh, they had kindred spirits. You know, people think that we're just, you know, illiterate thugs. Mm-hmm. And, but they're both, you know, like I said, voracious readers. Incredibly, uh, uh, philosophical and just incredible. I mean, yeah, I think yeah, Mike yeah. Tyson is an incredible speaker. Yeah, yeah. He, has, yeah. he has a speech impediment. And it's also, it's also uh, it, like you said, it's like a, like a tragic folk hero. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. I mean, at this point, in the in the beginning of the tragedy and downward fall, you know, he's at the top of the world yeah. at, at, in 86, 88. Yeah. And this is as he's getting married to Robin Gibbons and the Don King stuff is about to pop off. Yeah. And so... As it as it does happen, he go he goes and he talks to Beck quite frequently when he's in L.A. and Beck, you know, um, Iceberg would sit on his bed in his silk pajamas, just running, run, doing rundowns on on Tyson because Tyson was having a lot of woman problems, you know, Robin Gibbons and subsequent women, and he, you know, he says, um, 
you're going to leave here one day, like, and have women problems all your life. Because you'll just fuck anything. And then you want to give them all full speed ahead. You want to give them all everything you got. You will always have women problems, boy. Mm-hmm. I see you're satisfying. You're into satisfying every woman, and you're gonna lose at that every time. You let them invade your mind. You're going to always have some kind of connection with them, or they're gonna have some kind of connection with you because you have to satisfy that feeling. And that's very dangerous. Dangerous to yourself. You put that pressure on yourself. You don't feel good. You don't satisfy the woman. That's a problem with your mother. There's some connection that you had with your mother. The next year. He was accused by his wife of assault. Mm -hmm. And after that, he was convicted of raping Desiree Washington and served three years in prison. Uh, If you read his book, A Total Bullshit Trial, I don't don't want to say anybody lies about being raped or whatever, but it is very obvious through the fuckery that went on uh, in the judicial system that he was um, made an example of. Mm. Uh, if you hate me, call me pervert, call me freak, call me rape Paul, just call me what you want, but I'm standing by Mike Tyson in that one. Um, Do you think that's subjective? Subjective? Objective. Objective. Um, well, there's only uh, two people that really know. Sure. Um, and... I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I... How can... I don't know if I can be truly objective, but... Because you love Mike Tyson so desperately. Well, no, I love rape. <laughs> oh, my, my. No, I don't. I, I honestly, I was pretty indifferent to Mike Tyson uh, until, I mean, true. I mean, always, you know, I'll, he was the baddest man on the planet growing up. Mike Tyson's Punch Out, all that stuff. But I it, thought it was just like uh, when I read the book, I really I didn't, didn't like him at all because of his intentionally uh, nasty persona in the rounds of the fights. And then when I, you read the book, you you see it was all an act. Like, dude, it fucking started like I mean, Mike Tyson. Based, I would say, in mythology journalism, uh, started long ago. And my first taste of it was in something on VH1. Uh huh. Him building his own mythology? It was not built by him. But he, so I'm, I'm, it was I'm, somebody I'm, else going, like, oh, this is kid hey, here's the life of Mike Tyson, by the way. Right. And, like, did you know about all the, the pigeons and stuff? And I yeah. was like, Oh god, I didn't know that at all. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, you paint the portrait of his childhood and stuff but, like that. But you know, it also is mythological. It is. It is. It's They're not they don't. I mean honestly, if anything, the journalism around him did not even come close to the reality. No, the I'm, mythological I'm, nature of his Well that's the thing, is that most of the journalism is, is trying to tear him down. Uh, and I don't know if that necessarily means you know, uh, he he definitely did not commit this rape. But I would definitely say he did. He did say I have been absolutely horrible to women. Yeah. Uh, for much of my young adult life. Mm-hmm. But I absolutely never raped this woman. Yeah. I mean, he, no. he's, I've admitted to horrible things that I've done. Before. Sure. And I, I think you would um, authentically. Yeah. But uh, let's get to that on a, one yeah, of these yeah, profiles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it uh, later, Mike Tyson would mic- miss Iceberg's funeral because he's just in prison. Damn, that conviction. He says, "I wish I would have met Beck before I married Robin Givens. He would have set my ass straight." Um, hmm. one of it's the la- Robin Tiggins. One of the last time. Well, that's they say her name. She should have changed it to Robin Tyson because that's exactly what she was doing. Robin mm-hmm. Tyson. Wait, what? Robin. Robin. I get it. <laughs> Sorry. You know, um, Who's that? He never went to any Tyson's fights. Um, yeah, and he, but he was too old to get He was like, I, he, was, he was too vain to not dress up, and he was just too old to dress up. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he, was, he, he was really vain. He talked about how, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to die. I don't want to be ugly. I'm, I'm beautiful, and I don't want bugs eating my eyes. So Tyson gave him 25 grand to pay for his funeral. Fuck. So he could be like in some sealed thing where bugs would never go? Yeah. You shitting me. Nope. You're saying today, real bugs go. Dude, that's so dope. Yeah. Ain't no flies on me. Uh-uh. That's so no, good. I'm not my pants. Dude, that's so funny. Am I messed up? Because I want bugs to eat my ass? Uh, we'll talk oh, about that. No, 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 no. You're not at all. No, we'll talk about that. Um, and so now this is, now <laughs> we're getting to... You want me to eat your ass specifically? <laughs> yeah, I want to eat my yeah. ass. <laughs> eat my ass. As he, um... <laughs> 
That's what he said, Aaron. What? I know, it's funny. It's really good. What? Because it, you're telling a story for once a well, year. Can I play, can I that, play that, that role? Can I play the role it? of being a <laughs> Can I be the foil? Man, be the foil? man getting his ass ate I love by it. bugs. I love getting ass ate by bugs. He's like this bussy uh, fucking Yeah, and they're doing the his, the flies, and this thing. <laughs> the praying pants. <laughs> Yeah, no, I get it. I love it. I still, I gotta be. I gotta play. I gotta be the guy who doesn't like it. She's gotta be the monkey. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so the bugs are eating his ass. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. As the late, the eighties give way to the nineties. Beck's getting uh, more uneasy about social this the 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 race. Uh, conflicts in especially LA sure and he sees you know um, ca- echoes or at least um, things that kind of mirror the, the Watts right Watts yeah for sure first one's only. and Watts is now 67 I believe 65 65 yeah. and now we're getting to um, the, you know he's thinking about the Watts rights and what, well, the aftermath of that. Yes, it had. There were some. So, there were some reforms that that, that were, took place. But you know, the Watts riots and, and the Black Panthers. Uh, you know, they really cracked down after the, the the Watts riots were the first use of um, surveillance helicopters. Creation of the first SWAT team. Really. And then wow. and then Cointel Pro brought down the Black uh, Panthers. Yeah. And so he's he's going over this in his mind for the long, and, he, and now he's starting to see L. A. go this way. And he's playing it back like, well, after the vacuum of power to the Black Panthers and the the lack of jobs, uh, it's a good crime thing. Crips, the Crips, yeah. are, and, and and the Crips had a totally different um, ethos when it came to Black Power. And when when Crippen ha- Crippen happened, then there was a backlash to that with the Bloods. And so then now you have like. You know the, the Crip and the Blood con- conflict in LA, um, which is almost like black on black crime by design. Yeah, but I don't think I know the difference too much between their their ethos, which is also probably a subject for another episode. It's subject for another episode, but it was the Crips kind of, in his opinion, perverted the message that the Black Pan- Black Panthers had. Sure. And um, they they emphasize violence as a means to get more power. Yeah, the Black, Panthers. Well, the Black Panthers had a little bit more of a uh, political benefit. Certainly, the, the being armed and was a thing. S- servicing the community, right? Exactly, yeah. and so Feed- when they feeding people, right? Oh. And, and when Crippen happened, they were more overtly displaying the threat of violence, and then the Bloods, in his opinion, were well, like, truly organized as a defensive response to that. Yes, uh, and then he saw this black on black crime happen, and he couldn't help but. As my understanding of it, he couldn't help but see that this is almost kind of like the trick baby thing. Uh. Right? This kind of, oh, this is per, this serves them so, this serves the white so on. And then, then the crack cocaine thing, the crack, he has, you know, got the letter from the guy in jail, he sees it, the crack, comes to pro, black on black crime, LAPD beating the shit out of people, and then Rodney King happened. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with Rodney King, listeners at home, uh, Rodney King was pulled over by um, six police officers, and you know there's a very famous video came out where they beat the ever loving shit out of him. He, he was on PCP or whatever, and he, he, but I mean they really beat the shit out of him. Yeah, well, it was a celebratory. Uh... Ass whipping. Yeah. If you see the video, it's very clear. It just looks like a fucking rite of passage for a fucking yeah. uh, it, savage psycho. It looks that, like what you think like a clan beating would be because there's no reason for them to continue doing it and yeah. yet they keep. And this was also around the time the Rampart scandal, Daryl Gates. I mean, just LA was really not good at this time, uh, especially if you were a black man, right? And. and but then every also, time this shit starts. Whether it's cell phones or a guy on a tree with a fucking it, no VHS video camera is probably what Rodney King was. 
a guy with like an old school mm-hmm. like slam it yeah. in. And that was just a guy thing. at a gas station that was across the street that was and, like, what the fuck is really, going on? And really being like, okay, well, if this, if we caught this this one time, what did we miss? What did we miss? How many times did this happen last night and the night before that yeah. and the night before that? So in the last interview that he gives, he says, yeah, he puts the blame on, on the new right, right? He says that um, our dear friend Reagan, he's the one who turned this flood tide of not caring, and he's responsible, in my opinion, for the reactivation of overt racism to the extent and degree that it now flourishes. Yeah. You can replace Reagan with whatever name you think is relevant now. No, but he's right. Reagan, from what I can understand, he was just a yes man for powerful corporate interests. The country really went backward, man. And you know for a fact, any rational person knows that there's no way that the so-called gang culture could have become what it is today if just the minimal opportunity that existed prior to Reagan's administration had been enforced. And so, there's all this social unrest, black on the crime. Uh, He's got this album Reflections, and he doesn't know it at the time. Rodney King just happened then. There's a, there's a man who, who was at, at Crenshaw High School a few years before. He's from New Jersey, but uh, his name is Tr- Tracy Marrow. And he went to Crenshaw High School, hung out with the Crip set. And he was reading the, the work of Beck and Donald Goins, also a really prominent black writer. And he's uh, inspired by Beck. And he's familiar with, uh, he really likes the toasts that Iceberg some would do, and he would yeah. write his own. In the style yeah. of Iceberg. And Tracy was also sometimes called T by his friends. <laughs> and they would say, give us that ice, T. Yeah. And so, gangster rap starts with Ice-T. Drops the coldest rap. Uh, O'Shea Jackson, also another LA native, <laughs> also inspired <laughs> by Beck and right now the gang war happening in los angeles yeah o'shea jackson would go on to become ice cube ice from iceberg slim and it's the same rhyming couplet thing fuck the police coming straight from the brown got it back number like just the same style, but with yeah. different beats behind it. Faster. You know. What? And also just the writing, though, too. It's like, oh, shit, was definitely. The shit they had, you know, and they showed it very well in the Straight Outta Compton movie, too. It's just that easily at the heart of it all, uh, despite, same despite what's around you. Despite everything that happens, Ice Cube is the poet. Yeah. Yep. He's the poet. Yep. And, and he is not uh, the gangster. No, uh, no. As easy he is. But he is the one. Writing yeah. what he sees on a daily basis in, in his locale. So, um, so all this shit's happening all around the same time. He's still, he's got some stuff he's still writing. Rodney thinking, Rodney King thing happens. His diabetes is acting up. Um, he goes to the hospital. He's got gangrene in his foot. Mm, God damn it! Because he picked at a sword and didn't tell. Oh, him. dude! They tell him they want to amputate it. Yeah. He says, "I'm a pretty motherfucker. I need to think about it." <laughs> the Rodney King verdict comes out. Riots, April, 1992. Next day, he eats a hamburger. No. Goes into cardiac arrest. Hamburgers. Goes into cardiac arrest. Uh, hamburgers, what do you eat with? Yeah. Betty for the first yeah. time. Uh, Betty may shoot. Mm-hmm. Night two of the riots, he suffers cardiac arrest and passes away on April 30th, 1992. Because of the riots, his body can't leave the hospital for five days. Oh, God. May 9th, 1992. And they kept him on ice, right? <laughs> They did. It's poetic in a weird they way. They kept them on ice. Did they? No. I'm sure they actually yeah, they probably they, did. They must have. Refrigerated. Yeah, that's you know. not, damn. Yeah, that's not a, a good morgue isn't like, eh, hey, we'll let them just see what happens. Um, the bugs. 
Saturday, May 9th, 1992, his funeral was held at the Angeles Crenshaw Chapel. Over 100 people filled the church, including football great Jim Brown and actor Leon Isaac Kennedy, who was the one who introduced Tyson to him. No shit. Uh, Betty showed up, giving final respects. Diane, their children. Um, the mourners played Mama Dead over the loudspeaker so they could all hear his voice one last time. Mama Dead is wow. a special yeah. Uh, when the service is over, they went to Forest Lawn in Glendale. Hey. And, uh,. It's a, everything was paid for by Mike Tyson. Wow. It, his epitaph was... Funeral thought me, man. Hey, bud. Hey. Ninth grade, man. <laughs> word. Uh, uh, he My was, condolences. He was in laid to ground... In, uh, he was laid to rest in an above-ground mausoleum. Ooh, cool. Nice shit. Um, Let's fly. And the epitaph on his gravestone was... Iceberg Slim. Truth. Still shining down. Nice. Damn. And that's that a hell of a fucking is life. The life of Iceberg Slim, aka Robert Moppins, aka Robert Beck, aka Slim Lancaster, aka. Well, now, Aaron, what drew you to this man besides the ritual uh, dehumanization of women? <laughs> what a question. <laughs> it's like Terry Gross over here. And what? I mean, I love a good redemption story. The last act is the, the, the yeah, act. Yeah. Um, it's, all, it's all it is. And, and the greater the disparity between start and finish is, is really wonderful to me. I love the I agree. Ball and, uh, it, you know, this, it's, uh, it's somebody who had an indelible mark on not just black culture, but American culture. Mm -hmm. uh, every, everyone, everything points back to this guy. And it's such a, the book, Pimp, especially, is such a time capsule of a, of a world that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time it came out in the 60s, that world had already been gone. It was already 20 years past or yeah. 15 years past. Like, yeah. that whole world of the Midwest black pimp in in black meccas like that were, was already gone. And I also, it's I just a peak in a different world. And I think that black, uh, or, or, or like black culture to people like us, too, it's like, Always this thing that's like beyond and, and sort of mythologized by white men. Of course. Yes, and then when you get a glimpse through something like the autobiography of Malcolm X mm -hmm. or Iceberg Slam or something like that, and then you go like, God, but you don't see it. So, it's the, really the, very red pill. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, it is. It, in a way where you go like, and it, that's uh, not to say that I ever thought it was glamorous, but you know, as somebody, no, when you no. even, even it's, just, it's just, just saying, appreciate, when you can appreciate. Let's say you appreciate a fine work of art, or what, but you still cannot understand what went into it no. until you find out. Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so it's even even if, even if I don't fetishize it, I still um, I'm still you know blown away by everything that it took. To well, I think a lot, it. yeah, and a lot of people like that are creating those pieces of art in those times are also saying. Hey, yes, do go on this journey in my skin. Yeah. Please do step into my shoes. And hopefully you'll learn what I did without having to go through it. Yes, and also you will still remember that you are a white person that never would have to mm -hmm. or will ever have to. Right. You know, but but still do it and realize like, hey, this wasn't fun or cool or desired. Yeah, because he... Or you know, anything. He was somebody that, as, as he says in the book many times, you know, he... He just he fetishized it in the beginning. Yeah. He fetishized the pimp and the hustle world because yeah. he saw the guys coming into his mom's shop, and then it's kind of also this Sawyer thing in Lost, where it's like, oh, you're the guy that ruined my mom's life, and now I'm gonna be just like you. And so, it uh, he after so many warning signs from him, you don't want this life, kid. Get out of here. Go on, D Dickie. You don't want no part of this. Yeah. Do we? What? Yeah. He still goes for it. It's not addictive. It's, he still goes for it, yeah. and he learns the hard way that he never should have. And um, he, it, after all that, he takes what he learned in all the different schools and books uh, and, and turns it into, uh, he brings back something for everybody else to learn from. And in doing so, left a, an incredible mark on, on well, not only pop that, culture. But and, yes, but also seriously on black culture. Without a doubt. Forever. Because nobody had ever talked, nobody, like, you know, he, 
Let's James Baldwin. Baldwin. There's what? things you don't want to talk about. You don't want to talk about. Right, because you, I, James, somebody like James Baldwin. He has to. He has to be who he is, so that white and society at large will take him seriously. But not only that, James Baldwin himself might have very well existed. You know, uh, scholastically, uh, on on the benefit of somebody that was doing something as nefarious as pimping, of somebody being like, "Hey, that's a smart kid from our community. Mm -hmm. This is the only way we can get money." You know, he's selling drugs or right. you know exploiting our own people, and then we will just push this guy. And it's like, you don't have those guys without these people that have to make these very ugly, gross mm. sacrifices. I, I, I um, with Baldwin, I, I don't know if it's exactly that. I mean, he was uh, he became a white uh, school teacher who was very influential with him, and he grew up in a, a kind of lower middle class. Yes, yeah, so I'm not saying specifically, but, but, but I'm I, saying I, I, with I, people that get out, yeah. a lot of times it's at the benefit of somebody that's going like, you know, in the, in the same way as this, and, and, I, and I mean this in the exact same way, there's all of the Jewish families in New York sure. that were steeped in organized murderous crime, mm -hmm. and then they just go like, we don't talk about that anymore. Right, and, and they, it, but and, and, talking and, about and, it doesn't solve that. No, but you move on up, they go like, hey, one generation just had to suck dick for a minute. Well, that's the and, other and, and What the, are you saying about Rob uh, Iceberg Slim then? I don't understand. I'm saying that there's probably people that came out of the black experience that got uh, some kind of a leg up. And didn't want to talk about no. that what? life anymore? Maybe they did want to talk about it, but I'm just saying that a lot of times people that are forced into horrible conditions by the circumstances. Yeah, which is white circumstances. Yes. They have to get pushed ahead by people that are um, pretty nefarious. Right, I think with I think in his specific case, and he says it in there, all the pimps I knew were dead yeah. by 30 or yeah. drunk. Like, I think he was a special case. Yeah. Uh, and timing and then the the end of that lifestyle is a whole But it's an example thing. what I'm saying is it's an example of something that is shown so well in Moonlight. Which is? Which is the old dealer going like I ah, you're a good kid, I'll take care of you, blah right. blah blah but right. also I am still what I am. Right. You know. Well it, it sounds it doesn't like, mean I'm a monster. It sounds like what Iceberg was doing was was giving humanity to uh, a thing that had been Subscribed, uh, prescribed, believed to be unhuman. He was descri he was putting a human face right. on a thing that people would be like, I don't even know how anybody would ever do that. And right. then he's like, Well, well here's it, how. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's one of the few things that they'll working. allow us to do. Yes. Especially, yeah. especially when you get to Cleveland and stuff like that. But um, not only that, is that the, the yeah the when you say the human face on it is is not the day to day pimping. And the human the, face the, is the not human, the devil that the, you think it is. But the, hu the human face on it is this slow moral yeah. slide to be able. That's, that's how you can do anything. Start doing. That's, that's how they make you a soldier that can kill. The right. He, slow and he had to break slide. himself down. Right. Like he. And he like, had to break I, himself out. He had to break himself down to the game and then break himself out of it. Right. He's like, I didn't want to beat the shit out of him. I just had to. Eventually, I had to do cocaine so that, like, I could, you know. He really had to condition himself in so many ways to do these things, um, yeah. And then and then get out. I mean, he, he, it seemed like he was really aching to get out of it because once he said no, he never did it again. You know, like he right. really a fucking yeah cold turkey. Did. I, I I think I think that uh, as far as we know, again to be fair, he does pimp the reader a little bit in pimp and and Justin um, Gifford, the author of the biography, does he does kind of uh, do a good job of showing where... Yeah, yeah. And there's the thing, too, you know, where you know, like, all right, well, this person is fault here, so they could never be pimping me, and it's like, he just told you that's exactly how they pimped them all the time, yeah. but, you know. No, I, I, but also, no, I do think there is enough, like, admittance of fault that uh, he really doesn't sound like he totally knows what he's doing. Yeah. Morally. Well, it's not, you know, uh, Mitt Romney writing no apologies. <laughs> right. well, Mitt Romney. I always knew what was right. Mitt know? Romney's a soft man. But you know what I'm saying? As yeah, far as I mean, I... the, the, uh, 
the the Republican American novel, which is like I always had this vision and I followed it the whole way through. And then you read like I, the I, I was war fucking working by the flying by the seat of my pants, I, yeah, drinking I, girls in exactly, the for money. Exactly. And I had no the, help at all other than the fact never that my had dad a settled, owned a sports stadium. So. Yeah, there was just there was just, you you as you read it, you really get the the you get a sense of the a drift nature of his existence. Yes, well, he's, he's he's part of a structure, and also a luck of no structure. He, well, well, he's part of the structure of, of of work, and what he did is he worked. It, like but, he could have been a dock worker. Right, he, he, could have grown, he could have grown up in a family that were dock workers, right? And, and he would have been a great dock worker, right? But what? But, but to your point, I'm saying the structure that he was in was structureless. Yes, and that is, that is a structure for sure. But I mean, it was. As you read it, it's like, oh my god, he's just like bouncing from hotel to hotel, you know, renting, you live in hotel rooms, and, you know. The structure was hotel rooms, it was just, different no, hotel it's rooms. It's just so, uh. But, but so, so there's, I'm sorry, finish that. No, uh, finish yeah, that. No, 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 no. Well, it was so what? Uh, a, a drift is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, just yeah. flow, just kind of, just, you know, not rudderless, but you are, f f you know, uh. You're, yeah, you're the tra you're the bag in American Pew. It's the the part yeah, of the yeah, book that makes good. you feel like, yes. all right, what do we do now? So it, it, if you're reading along with it on a day to day basis, you are like, you're filled with anxiety. I mean, there's countless times in his life when it's, I have zero money and I need to go to a bar and find a woman to have sex for me, not with me, before me, before me, and I need to somehow convince her that I am God. Like, it's just this. He was a magician. He was a salesperson. He he was an it was all these things that he said in his prison bio, but in not the way that he meant it. Um, it's just it, and it's I don't I don't want to envy it or, or want to uh, you know um, paint it in a better picture than it is. But it's just this. No, but also really, okay. all I have is my skull, and I'm using it to trick my way into some existence. Well, the thing, so the thing is mind-boggling. The thing is too is that we don't really think about it enough as uh, we don't think from our pussies is what I would say. I always think from I don't I don't think we do. I and, think from yours. And part of it is that you you wouldn't know how to it's, it's too it's complex it's for you. Shit. You don't understand it. Um but I would say if you're looking at it from the woman's perspective. Um well, well, we've been we've been uh, characterizing this whole time as as being duped at, in some kind of way. And I would say, you know, from the new woman in the bar that he needs to go find to have sex for him, as you say, you might be thinking, like, I'm part of, like, this, like, huge scam conspiracy we're, thing. Yeah, we're scam like, like we, guys. we are, like, I am not a, I'm not the one getting duped. It's right. this guy that just fucked me. We're, we're, we we're fucking him. We're fucking him. Like, and, we're and, duping and him. And she may be... Also playing, I mean, oftentimes playing the pimp too, not giving him all the money. Of course. Ask for 100 to take 10. Well, I asked for 100 got 50. I'll tell you I took 10, right? Yeah. I mean, it, they're subjecting yourself to exploitation and beatings is not fun, but there is some agency that some of these women have, or at least as much agency as they could have. Um, yeah. Uh, and so there is, there is power there relative but to even the if, situation. But even if you're a total shill... And and falling for his shit every time and you know impervious to lying to him. I think part of you would think like, oh no, this guy, this is my real boyfriend. I fooled this other guy right. into thinking he's my right. guy for the night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it still feels like some kind of power. Yeah. It still feels interesting. You gotta take what you get. Yeah. Um, Thank you for listening to the very long two-parter. Yes, it was really fun. Time. It was really fun. It was just so much. I mean. I'm listening to another book. I'm listening to Trick Baby right now. It's so good. Oh, it's just a... Is it... When he said, I gotta write for uneducated blacks and whites and it's fifth grade reading, it's not fifth grade reading level, but it is... It's not. Pop reading. Yeah, it's it's, well, fun. Well, it's well, fun to... It's, it's fun. accessible. I, I mean, so... so accessible it's, it's, is what Noam Chomsky also tries to do, mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah. If you if you really want to reach everybody, you, 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 you deliberately it's talk accessible. out of fifth grade reading level. Well, so there's, 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 there's two things that I, I want to uh, touch on. Uh, one is that it, it, his writing reminds me of like a Charles Williford, which is a great pulp. Writer. I mean, he's, he, Slim is basically a pulp novelist. Yeah, I was going to say Bukowski. Uh, yeah, but but uh, and and, I, and there's a place for that. There's no. 
it only helps. There's no reason for there only to to be a Baldwin of and not a black pulp, right? There's, there's, there should be a space for everybody in every one of those things. But the other thing that I find really fascinating is um, what a difference. You, you, know, you meet someone who's 60 and the transformation they made in their life from 30 to 60 is insane. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you meet someone who's 29 or 30, they think they have an idea of what everything is. Mm-hmm. And in their world, it is correct. In that moment. But the difference, it's easy to forget that 60 is another a lot 30 years. 30, yeah. It's another 30 and, years. And not only are you changing, right? Every, every Even biologically, even your testosterone, all that stuff. The world is changing. Yeah, and the world is changing faster than you're changing. Exactly, and so you are struggling to keep up. You're fighting last, you're fighting the, the last war's battle. Yeah, yeah. And so you're struggling to keep up, and it, if you can just tread water, you, you're gonna do better than most anybody. And uh, just this whole book feels like treading water. Yeah. Barely, yeah. it just. <sighs> there was a brief moment where he is on top of what the cultural mm-hmm. thing is. And then it changes. Yeah. As soon and, as he figures the game out, the game changes. And then he's, and when he gets out of jail that last time, he's just swimming to yeah. the front. And it's, you know, the thing about icebergs. They're mostly underwater. <laughs> Let me see the tip. That's what I, uh, and, Aaron Peter. and the tip is all we need. You like that metaphor, ladies and gentlemen? You can get more metaphors like that on Patreon. More <laughs> metaphors like that, $5 you can get a month. You get metaphors, metaphors. and yeah, and the cancer has been fatified. Should we call it? Yeah. Let's go. No, no, no. <sighs> no, let's so keep it going. Uh, let's, let's go back into uh, Vanilla oh. Ice and his... Vanilla Iceberg. No, Vanilla Ice, he oh was... Oh my all, god. Was that part of it? I don't know. I'm at Bruce so. I'm here. <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll do it all again. Uh, uh, my name is John Fahey. I want to say goodnight. I love you. I love you too. Uh, thank you for letting these three white guys talk about uh, black culture in America in a genuine way. Yeah, uh, and, throw dogs to the board. And if we're you know totally off base, forgive us and welcome comments. But I really enjoyed uh, both books that I read. And um, thank you for listening. Yeah, I appreciate. Thank you. Goodnight, everybody. We love you. Yeah.